And in other news, Godzilla waited ashore today in New York City with his human-sized accountant, a Mr. Ponchant Whiff from Titsville, Maryland, and attempted to get a bank loan. The loan was to put an extension on his watery home, which currently spans several acres on the Atlantic seabed and comprises, amongst other things, a large dining area, a man cave filled with, of course, the corpses of actual men, and an elaborate sex dungeon. Sadly, though, despite Mr. Whiff's attempts to translate, and the mayor of New York telling people not to panic as he flew from his private runway in a jet made of gold adorned with rocket launchers, many people were killed under Godzilla's large drippy paws as he attempted to navigate up Broadway to find an establishment with the best interest rates. People being what they are, some cheered, waving flags, playing drums, and generally smelling like a backed-up trash compactor in solidarity for kaiju rights, and made demented pleas to have the 70-foot underwater-dwelling Japanese nuclear monster considered an American citizen, and allowing him the right to vote, collect unemployment, and to play backgammon after nightfall with his pals Gamera and Mechagodzilla on Governor's Island between the months of July and October. Head pundits on Fox News spent all morning debating his existence, and even after part of his ankle took out half of News Corp's 48th Street offices, Bill O'Reilly was sure he was a figment of pinhead scientist's imagination and declared the whole Manhattan invasion to be the president's fault. Meanwhile, everyone else ran, screamed, turned to religion, or were simply swiftly trampled under foot or tail under the watchful glare of media cameras from around the world. Bono is already in talks to produce a charity single and a video featuring some of the wealthiest, most androgynous-looking and incredibly earnest celebrities begging regular low-income families to hand over their hard-earned money is in pre-production right now. More on this as it develops. And now... Welcome to this week's episode of the After Movie Diner, and uh, it's always a thrill to have this gentleman uh, back on the show. Uh, he is uh, Danvers, Massachusetts, answer to Randy Newman, um, and one of the most prolific uh, songwriters of this or any age. In fact, the most prolific songwriter this possibly ever has been. Um, he's also a fantastic uh, writer, actor, and producer of wonderful uh, monster-based B-movies. Uh, it is, of course... Uh, the now legendary and Wired magazine featured, uh, although they're <laughs> bastards for not liking him, uh, Matt Farley. Hello, sir. Welcome to the diner once more. Thank you, and I'm taking over the diner. You this are. Is, You're taking over is, the show. This is the After Movie Diner infomercial podcast uh, for yes. the next, for however long this takes, because we are celebrating the release of Catch Up or Don't, See If I Care, by miscellaneous plumbing fixtures. And, and what a and mouthful that, that is. <laughs> it's a great title, but it's a great band name and a great title. And um, listeners, uh, the host of the diner is miscellaneous plumbing fixtures. Where did that um, um, pseudonym come from, John? Well, as, as all things, it came from a completely innocuous moment. I was on a job uh, in North Las Vegas working for um, the government there. I was, I was working in the... Um, I was basically scanning maps and blueprints of North Las Vegas into a computer and then putting it on microfish. Uh, Very you... Kafka esque um, occupation, I feel. Yes, completely. Uh, but there was all <laughs> these like big plans, big schemes, big big maps and things. And on one of them, um, it said, uh, I think near a blueprint for a building, it said and miscellaneous plumbing fixtures or something like that on the thing. And I was like. Oh, mm. I like that. That'll do. And I wrote that down. I don't know why it stuck with me, but I just liked, I liked the uh, randomness of oh, and get us a pile of plumbing things. Like it was, it was so. It wasn't specific. It wasn't you know we need a wrench and uh, 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 pipes and whatever. It was just nah, just miscellaneous stuff will do. It, it's wonderful, wonderfully vague. Right. And then the other thing that there's a there's a track on the first ever album that I did as miscellaneous plumbing fixtures, uh, which funny enough is not on Bandcamp, um, but uh, was a track called Weatherproof Commander, which is like a blues song about like the weatherproof commander as if he was some sort of mad local uh, superhero, but not a superhero like one of these guys who like dresses up as a superhero and, and prowls the neighborhood. Um, and uh, that was based on the name of a 
uh, alarm, a house alarm that you could buy for, for, the, for the outside of your building that was called the Weatherproof Commander. And I thought that's such a grand, uh, uh, over-the-top title for what's just a little flashing box. Yeah. Well, that's, that's the reason why we should all keep a notebook in our pocket or nowadays with our, our phones have the little notepad on the phone so that when you come across these, uh, these inspiring little things, you jot them down and then you work them into... Uh, into your art. So that's, that's good stuff. So ladies and gentlemen, listening to the show, you realize John Cross is not only a prolific podcaster uh, who entertains us all the time, but he's a fantastic musician. And you do know this because you've been listening to the diner and we get so many diner ditties all the time. Now, have any of these songs ever been played on the diner before um, or no? Of the latest album, I think a couple of the very early ones. It's a bit of an odd album because it's been put together over the last 18 months. And I had mm -hmm. a batch of about five or six songs that were done um, about 18 months ago or within the last sort of uh, uh, the first sort of six months of that block. Then some of those have been played, but most yeah. most of them are more recent and most of them no i haven't played the the opening Never. track i remember i've you sent me some some demos a, a while back and i remember the opening track especially but i feel like you might have even played it on the on the diner but mm -hmm. regardless um here here it is this amazing album called catch up or don't see if i care and it, the, what the title is saying to me is um hey world I just made an amazing album, and I bet you're not going to pay attention to it, but but I'm putting it out anyway. Is that what you're saying? It, well, it's it's not particularly like this album is amazing, but but it's it's the idea of look. There's all this stuff going on, um, certainly internet stuff, and we've spoken about this before with a lot of what you're doing and what I'm doing and what our friends are doing online. And it's like look catch up or don't like we don't care we're going to be producing great stuff anyway but uh yeah catch up or don't i suppose that's where it comes from it's again one of those things completely came off the top of my head i think i was feeling a bit kind of flippant one day and a bit maybe a bit edgy one day and a bit just kind of ah fuck it you know the world and um i was creating the album cover Mm -hmm. uh, which which has all this sort of it's a bit of a collage, uh, although it looks like one photograph. It's actually like a bunch of things put together. And I did the title on it, Catch Up or Don't See If I Care, as a kind of throwaway sort of thing. I then saved it, but I didn't save one without the title on it. So when mm -hmm. I came to do the album sort of months and months later, it had to be called that. And I'm perfectly happy <laughs> with that. But again, it's one of those things that didn't really mean anything. But yes, it does kind of mean, you know, hurry up and take notice. Or, oh, don't. Like, I'll, I'll keep doing it. You know? <laughs> We're, yeah, nothing's going to stop us from, um, right. from creating stuff. Um, it would be nice if people caught up. But we're not going to stop otherwise. Uh, either way, it's also a, it's also a little bit just to get a bit highfalutin. But it was probably on the day that I was I was I was writing that. It was a much about the creativity thing, as it is just in general that idea that the world doesn't catch up quick enough. There's there's normally a generation that goes, oh, are we still discussing these things of the past? You know, I mean, I don't want to get political, but you know, gay marriage or abortion or whatever, whatever it is. And I understand people have opinions on everything, but there are some things that as far as most gener you know, this latest generation is concerned, come on, let's, let's stop going back over these things. Let's just deal with them and move on. They've been decided. They've been uh, debated by the so-called highest minds in the country. Let's just get on with it. And there's always a feeling of any generation of like catch up or don't, but let's, you know, let's kind of, get on with it that, that that's another part of it I suppose. that's that's a bigger picture uh interpretation of the phrase i like I it guess. Yeah, yeah, yeah. so I, i've listened to this album um probably about 10 times now uh start to finish and, i'm honored um, sir that's, that's yeah, what i'm honored yeah. I, the, my baby has uh probably listened to you more than any uh any other artist so that's pretty cool you're wow you're you're informing his musical taste, you know. <laughs> As he, Poor he's roll, kid, stop playing him something else. <laughs> he's rolling around on the floor to uh, to songs like um, uh, what is I had you, you know. He's rocking out. We'll get to that. But uh, the general theme that I'm getting from this album, and correct me if I'm wrong, is um, ah, life, the daily <laughs> grind, the daily hustle. What's the what's the point? 
And uh, the point is that there's still moments of solace that can be found, especially at the movies, but not just at the movies. And as a side note, um, the singer has really got to start going to bed earlier because... <laughs> Because by the time you're done listening to the album, you're like, look, hey, miscellaneous plumbing fixtures. Maybe let's set a bedtime for 1 a.m. I'm just saying. <laughs> right. So um, are, that's a general. Uh, any other themes that you think shine through? Yeah, I, I, was, a little, I was a little worried that the album would, would uh, uh, maybe on occasion come across a bit like that thing you don't like, which is the tortured artist thing. And it's not, it's not meant to do that at all. Honestly, a lot of the album is brutally honest stuff. Mm -hmm. And then there's about five tracks on the album that are completely works of, you know, this is a bit... Uh, fiction. Uh, uh, yeah, complete works of fiction, but in a sort of Dylan way, stream of consciousness, gobbledygook poetry, um, you know, uh, just made up stuff, stories. Mm -hmm. I love telling stories about things. I love imagining... Uh, movies in song, doing road movies, especially road movies, but I love the idea of uh, taking a character and traveling them somewhere in order to to uh, deal with a particular thing in life. And, you know, autobiographical things float in and out of those songs, but it's... Um, uh, I, I liked mixing it up. And with the, with the, with the tracks on this album, it's, it's uh, weird because I don't play it chronologically. Um, so the track from 18 months ago, uh, I thought, although weirdly enough, the track from 18 months ago is the first track, but, but it doesn't go chronologically from there. I've mixed the tracks up and done the track listings so that the album is a interesting listen musically. The themes yeah. actually go back and forth from the most recent of my life to, to 18 months ago. And, you know, you know that personally a whole bunch of stuff has happened to me in that time that, that I'm commenting on and singing about and talking about. Um, and so that, but those particular topics bounce all the way back and forth in the album, um, uh, right to the last uh, track. Uh, but I did it musically so that there are highs and lows as you listen because lyrics are great to delve into for people who want to have a third or a fourth or a fifth listen. But I also want this to be a pop record that people could just put on and be like, oh, this is a fun tune or whatever. Yeah, yeah. You don't, you don't want five super you know, slow downer <laughs> songs in a row. You know? no, so well, you that's, mix it that's the problem is sort of 18 months ago it would have been one type of song and then in the middle of the album it would, <laughs> it would have been five or six really depressing yeah, tracks. Yeah, <laughs> but it's, it's, per it's perfect the way it is. It mix, mixes... Um, you mix it together very well. So let's look at the first song, uh, All Hell Breaks Loose. Great way to open an album. Um, so you're, you're doing everything, um, every instrument here, right? We, the guitar, you're doing the guitar solo. Are, you the, are nobody, you the backing vocals too? Is that yes, you? there's nobody else on this album. It's everything on here is me. In fact, the only kind of, the only album I have where there's any collaboration are the Dinah Ditties. This is all me. What about so? Is that a real trumpet or is that a synth trumpet? Uh, and I had you. Uh, that's a synth trumpet. That's oh, actually that's part of something that's on Garage Band or Garage it sounds, Band. Yeah, sounds great. Yeah, I love it. You have to keep it low in the mix, and you have to stick a bunch of echo on it. But yeah. there's a. Uh, it's one of these things that when, like you have on synthesizers, where you press the note and it'll go. Brrr, it'll like mm -hmm. go up and then fade down like if you just did a, a one note on a trumpet so it has this interesting thing so as you press it and if you go from one note to another note to another note it has this swell effect like it goes mm -hmm. like it has this getting louder effect and i loved it it sounded really good with that play out at the end of that song i was really happy. i thought yeah i thought you found a trumpet player and brought him uh, to your apartment to uh, to play that so well, well that, done that might happen with the next album i'm looking to do the next album with all real different musicians that's the hope isn't it? that's cool uh, so uh, awesome song uh and right here's that theme you know i'll be out of the movies you know that's um yeah we know you're a movie lover, and it, and it shines through in this album, which not only do you sing about going to the movies and you sing about movies, but um, there, there's a cinematic quality to a lot of the songs, too, I, I think. Um, yeah. we should, how about we listen to some of uh, All Hell Breaks Loose, this great intro track? Great. Let's play a few seconds. Oh, baby. 
baby don't know which stockings my baby just can't choose. But baby don't know what lipstick and baby can't find her shoes. I don't want to be around. Love it! I love it. The, Thanks, uh, the the guitar solo um, part later on in the song, spectacular. Way to go! How many? Uh, how long does it take you to make a song like this for the recording process? Um, for the recording process, it's only maybe two or three hours. Um, but uh, for the, the the lyrics are always the hardest thing for me. Um, tunes come pretty easily, and then once I've got a theme with the tune i can kind of do a nice uh uh mix arrangement on it um there are some songs where i had the availability of an electric guitar and a bass and um some other instruments that i don't no longer have but um uh so there are different sounds on different songs and also some songs i do fuller like this, which I consider a a big production number, and then there are other songs which I purposely kind of strip down. Yeah, well, great work. Uh, songs in my head uh, a lot. I'm a big fan. Bravo. And um, the next thing, next song, make or break. I love this this line. Always a case of make or break, and make is falling far behind. That that is a great little uh, some great wordplay right there. And <laughs> it's uh, it it almost it feel is. That's not a phrase that I know of, but it should be. That should just be a thing that people say. But it, it isn't, right? Um, yeah, uh, make or break is a... Is oh, a, make or break, but uh, I mean the concept, second but, part. Yeah. Oh, uh, yeah, make, no, the second part is completely me. It's my, um, it's my slightly depressive side coming out. And it, there's also a slight uh, truth to it as well at that particular time when I was writing the song. Yeah, well, well it, it's very evocative phrase, you know. It gets to the point in a uh, in a in a nice little poetic way, and it's um it's a great great little song, and it 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 it, it's, it goes well from the the full band rock out uh, of the opening track to to more of a a laid back uh, kind of muted uh, folky thing going on here. Well, the so, thing the thing with the opening track is it's it's. It's rocky without being like I had you as like the big kind of driving kind of rocking number, but the uh, the opening song, it's it's rocking, but it's also kind of slightly stripped back in its in its design. So, and I I didn't want to open the album with um, this. This is of course sounding like highfalutin terms, but like the hit single. I wanted to open the album with a uh, a song that definitely opens an album, but it also heralds, this is going to be a slightly different sounding album. This is not going to be, because I could have started the album with like Handbag Full of Guns, which is like the driving kind of fun, silly, knockabout, rubbish song in the middle kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, But I didn't. I, I purposely picked the one that's, it's still a, 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 a punch to it, but it, it symbolizes that the album is going to be a mixture of uh, uh, fiction and nonfiction as well because there's definitely bits in 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 the, the first track uh when all hell breaks loose that is autobiographical there's other stuff in it that's complete made up um well, let's listen to a little bit of make or break ladies and gentlemen this is, this is good stuff this is uh john cross and he is a folky poet let's hear it <laughs> Everyone is full of suggestions, but it just leads to loads more clues. But what if there is no more walking to be done in these tired old gum shoes? What happens if it happens again? What happens if you're powerless to stop it? What happens if it happens on somebody else's watch? When it should be you that got it Going back to the start 
I, All right. I, I'm already feeling like I'm taking this way too seriously. <laughs> okay. No way. No way. Okay. If, if you don't, uh, if you don't appreciate the genius of your work, no one will. All you right. Know? Well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna slip into your mode of being like I am the greatest songwriter alive. <laughs> yeah, um, do- because I need to just to get through this. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, next song that I like is "Cast a Shadow." Oh, you um, like that one? Okay, this was the one that I wasn't sure about including in the album because I don't know what this song is about. Um, I have no idea where this song comes from at all. Cast a Shadow, super cinematic. I imagine like a desert landscape. You know, the sun is going down after the, the two main characters have had a discussion about life, you know, and then there's that moment in the movie where the music um, slowly uh, swells and... Um, and we just see the, the beautiful landscape for a few seconds, and, and you get goosebumps. This is the song that could be playing there, and it, a great melody. Yeah. And what are you saying there? Are you saying, and them and I, you know, and them and I? Is that what you're saying? Oh, right, right, right. And them and I. Yeah, and, and them and I. Yeah, it's about the, because there's two characters rolling down a hill or something like that. I guess it's like Jack and Jill uh, imagery or something. I, I don't quite know. And then it talks about them casting a shadow, but I don't know if we ever will or something. I have, I, this is, li- <laughs> I, no, I'm not, I'm not kidding. Cause I was listening to the album earlier, knowing that you were going to ask me about stuff. And I was listening to this song and I was trying to put myself into the place where I wrote the song. I've no idea what the song's about. I've no idea where this song comes from. I've no idea what the lyrics mean. And I don't know why it's recorded in this sort of echoey dream way that no other song on the album is. It's um, fine. Yeah, it has like a vinyl sound to it, like a scratchiness a right. little bit too. Uh, well, I have no idea what it meant either. And, um, for I, you know, that phrase you re- repeat several times, I didn't even know if you were saying there am I or them and I. <laughs> and um, it Neither didn't ma- did I until I listened to it. <laughs> <laughs> it didn't matter. It didn't matter because it's uh, it's just a great, uh, just a great song. Great melodies, especially. Way to go, that little. Enough of me. Let's let's listen to it. Okay, sir. Rusted engines, teeth carving names till dark And Canada geese like the view oh, They cast a shadow but we don't know if they always do And them and I Shouting in an empty room, something happens sometime soon And them and I Old head rolling round in the air How do I tell them that I really just don't care? The street signs cutting through the cold They keep on walking till it gets old Yeah, seriously, like I, the the people listening to this podcast right now, we're, we're holding up their cell phones and swaying <laughs> back and forth. I'd like to go old school on it. Let's hold up lighters. Let's, lighters. Let's, let's no, go yeah. back to lighters. I mean, I know we're not a smoking nation anymore in the same way as we used to be, but everyone should go to a gig with a lighter rather than a cell phone. I, I don't care if you don't smoke, buy a, a cheap $2 lighter to go to a gig with because screw this holding up your cell phone. Go I think at, at miscellaneous <laughs> plumbing fixtures concerts, when people uh, come in, they should all be given a lighter. Sure, uh, tr- you know? sure. yeah, yeah, yeah. That's I'll part of the that. experience. I'll do that. Or some, some sort of safety version of it. I have this. This is fantastic. This is something that my friend Meg bought me. You'll love this. This is a, it's a battery uh, but uh-huh. on top of it, there's this little gizmo, and uh, look at that right there. Oh, nice! That's you perfect. Could, it lights up. It's it's like a flashlight or a, a torch or whatever. It's two little LEDs uh, uh, with a plastic covering on top of a, a battery, a nine, is it nine volt nine battery. Volt. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. it turns a nine volt into a flashlight. Yeah, and then check this: when you turn it off, the top is illuminated. 
uh, for a um, little while. The plastic is, is glow in the dark. So uh, I think this is what we should now give people at gigs. It's a cheap alternative, but it's, it's old school and it's scientific and it's fantastic. And it, it's a little gizmo. You can buy them on Amazon. <laughs> Let's do it. Although we're here to promote your album. Enough <laughs> about the uh, the right. nine volt uh, flashlight. <laughs> All right, next song. Um, next song that made an impact on me. The whole album's great. Don't get me wrong, but we I can't. Just, I just oh, wanted yeah. to make one point on on your because this will make you laugh. Martin and the Video Shop Closure. That song, which is track three. Yes. I don't want to necessarily play it or go into it too much, but I I posted the album on a, a Facebook group that is a feedback. It's just called feedback. And people post all sorts of random stuff and people provide either serious or comical feedback uh, on it. Uh, memes and things and, and odd pictures. So I posted the album and one woman who I don't know at all, uh, she was like, who is Martin? Is Martin real? And did he find another video shop? And I thought... <laughs> Ah, how sweet, like how wonderful that she thought this like character was real. Then I suddenly went, Does he, he die dies the at the end yeah. of the song. <laughs> what do you mean? Is he real? He's dead. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, she only listened to the first half, right. I guess. Yeah. She probably got to track three and went, I've got to ask him a question. She just heard like the first verse. Um, uh, but yeah, very sweet. Well, and it's good. Uh, the, the video stores, uh, you know, I could I could lament the the the, the death of the video store uh, all, all night, and I'm glad you tackled that too. Well, that the, 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 there's one verse at the very end, which is, I mean, the whole song is basically just you don't know what you've got till you lose it, and it, <laughs> and it uses the video store both actually and metaphorically. But no. now, um, dancing as the world ends is awesome. Uh, I like this it one. It okay. starts off with that lively uh, countdown. Uh, which, <laughs> Do you know which, what that comes from? That comes from Billy Joel. Because oh, there's really? that great track of Billy Joel's, I forget what it is. But he starts it off with the worst countdown ever. Where he goes, one, two, a one, two, three, four. <laughs> and it's a ma matter of trust. Yeah. Right. And it's such a ridiculous countdown. <laughs> that when I was doing it, I, I was I was also caught up in the moment because it's got quite a li lively like guitar riff that I'm doing, and it was just like one, two, whatever, and I kick in, and I, I just enjoy doing that. Plus, every album should have a track in which the guy counts it down. Sometimes I do it on multiple tracks, and I have to like edit out the countdown because I suddenly realize I've got four tracks back yeah. to back. But but. Uh, <laughs> Uh, every every album should have at least one where the, the songwriter uh, 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 tries to do uh, an enthusiastic countdown. I think it's an old trope that needs to come back. Next time I'm going to bring whistling and a song back. That needs to be brought back as well. <laughs> I like that. I like that. Uh, let's bring it back. That's that's real good. Uh, let, let's listen to it. Let's hear this this great countdown and this lively song, which it's just uh, vocals and guitar and just one guitar and vocals. Is that right or is there more going on there? I think it's basically just just vocals and guitar. Yeah, I don't well, think you, there's it, much more overdubs on it. You get a lot of energy with a, out of a little amount of uh, instruments. All right, let's hear some of Dancing as the World Ends. One, two, three, four. Oh, one, two, three, four! If it was up to me I'd have these four walls preserved in a museum for families From Wyoming to tell their relatives to come and see them And this is where they'll find me when their games come to a close In a state of perpetual anxiety and some cheap but comfy clothes The world outside them is vibrant and awake if I told you what I've eaten, you'd think it was a mistake. Hello, three in the morning, let me call your bluff. Four is just around the corner, and I've not nearly had enough. And I'll be dancing as the world ends, with every muscle and tendon I can spare. Not because the world ends, but because the opportunity to dance is. Now, I'm not sure if this is the first time uh, that it's referenced, but it's definitely not the last time that the wee hours of the morning are referenced <laughs> in this song. Right. And it's done in a great way. Hello, three in the morning. 
I'm here to call your bluff. It's nearly 4 a.m. and I've not nearly had enough. Maybe I paraphrased a bit, but that's yeah. great. What a what a great evocative phrase. And um, what are you doing? What are you doing um, out at these hours? Or, or is this even you? <laughs> oh no, this is definitely me. Any reference okay. to, to small hours <laughs> is definitely me. And um, and what's weird is though is I feel like I've messaged you in the small hours and and you've been awake, but it might be on the night shift or something. When no, uh, well, what it is is uh, if I wait, I, I or baby I might, times maybe with baby, the baby times. I I just wake up briefly in the middle of the night and of course got to check Twitter and uh, quick, <laughs> quickly respond and then. And go back to sleep. <laughs> oh, I see. Yeah, yeah. No, um, this is a weird thing that I found. Uh, you know, people know that I'm currently unemployed apart from temping. And uh, when I go long periods without temping, or even even if it's just I'm not going to be temping for three days, let's say, my body clock, for whatever reason, and I, I'm doing it based purely on when I'm tired, my body clock sets itself to about falling asleep around sometimes 10 or 11 a.m., mm. sleeping through till like 4 or 5 p.m., and then being up all night. I just have a vampiric yeah. body clock. I don't know why. Um, there's that. There's also the fact that I've always been a nighttime person, just in general. It's just, it's just where I've always been uh, comfortable. It's not a... Uh, there's there's some references on the album where it's like, oh, I'm up at this time in the morning and I'm feeling sad. But uh, that is just specific references to uh, uh, certain times over the last year. Um, I have always been a night owl, always. Uh, you know, even when I was a, a, an early teen and I was hanging out with John and Jim, who have been guests on the podcast several times, and we all grew up together. We're all old friends. Mm -hmm. Um we would watch movies late and they would stay up till like 2, 3 a.m. We'd watch old Hammer horror movies. And even after they'd go to bed, I would like grab VHS from their room before they'd go to bed. And I'd watch another movie before I then crashed out on the couch or in the spare room or whatever. So I was always a night owl. It just, it's just where it's I cool. feel comfortable. And, and it shines through. You know, this is your album and it, it's great. It, it totally reflects your, uh, your viewpoint and your approach to, to life. So that's pretty darn awesome. I now, also there, there was some time over the last year where I would be uh, out with a friend uh, late till about eleven eleven thirty, and then they would go home. And I like to I I love walking New York. You know this about me. This is mm -hmm. the thing. I love walking New York. There's a bunch of like twenty four hour places. There's like a twenty four hour diner. There's twenty four hour Best Buy. There's there's a bunch of stuff where you can kind of um, get in out of the cold and and still be up uh, and wandering about. Um, and I love that, particularly around sort of 14th Street uh, and, and Soho area. If you see a crazy person at three in the morning dancing to his headphones, that's me. Because uh, <laughs> I'm out at three in the morning on 14th Street uh, with, the, with the hobos and the night owls uh, uh, dancing. Normally I have my headphones on and I am not shy about it. If a rocking tune comes on, I'm clicking my fingers, I'm waving my hands and I'm singing along. I don't care because it's three in the morning, man. It's my time. I, I don't care. <laughs> Ex excellent. I love it. Now, the beauty of uh, also of this song, Dancing as the World Ends, is uh, the listener might think, uh, wait, is this guy happy that the, that the world's ending? Is uh, is that why he's dancing? And per that must have crossed your mind because in the refrain, you clarify and you say, I'm not dancing because the world ends. <laughs> no, no. But because the opportunity to dance is there. And uh, it's actually... It's a good thing that you do reference it because then it, it it any chance of it being a celebration of destruction is out the window and it's it's actually just a celebration of joy. It's a, well, it's a celebration of defiance and joy is what it is. It's like it doesn't matter and the world ending is not the whole world. It's my world um, that's ending uh, in the song um, and it's it's uh, it's look things get bad. But there's always dancing, I think, is kind like of where that. it's coming from. Yeah, um, I, I get the vibe. The, I get the general vibe, and it, it's great. Yeah, and it's, but it's an upbeat song. It's a positive song. It's, it's uh, like a friend of mine years and years ago, because um, I've always been this kind of writer. It's, it's, not, it's not just recently. But years and years ago when I was writing four-track songs, because I've written serious, quote-unquote, serious songs, and I know you hate the distinction because all songs are good songs, um, and I, I don't mean to, but I just mean non-Dino Ditty songs or non-comedy mm -hmm. songs. 
Um, I've written those since I was like uh, uh, 14, 15, and they used to be awful, awful poetry. And they may still be, I don't know. But um, <laughs> uh, I used to play them for a select group of friends, but I, I rarely would, would do, uh, do it for anyone else. And one of my friends described my songs as, you know what, as long as you don't listen to the lyrics, you'll be okay, because I write very upbeat, like, jolly tunes, uh, because I have that uh, uh, a thing of loving melody. I'm like you, I love Billy Joel, I love McCartney, I love some Randy Newman, I love someone who can do melody. I think that's very important to a song. Um, and I hate this thing where... Because it's a sad song, it has to be drony and radio heady and introspective, whiny crap. I hate that. Uh, I, I much prefer a happy go lucky song that might be talking about weightier issues. But that's a good way to deal with it. Everything should be dealt with with joy and silliness and dancing, even if it's the most despair part of your life. Well, well said. Well said. And uh, yeah, melody. The your your knack for for melody shines through um, from the start to finish here. Uh, any listeners out there, um, if if you don't already have John Cross's voice in your head all the time <laughs> from the diner, which which right. I do, you know, like sometimes I just think, I just think in your voice. Because, oh, poor you, sorry. <laughs> because I've heard so much of it. Um, but <laughs> now you can have. Up. I have had your uh, your singing. Um, your, your I had you specifically just been in my. I'm just walking around just and I had you. Yeah, constantly in my head. Likewise, dancing as the world ends. And likewise, um, you've got the wheels, you've got the lights, the shining chrome from Part Machine, which is a, an, another spectacular melody. Way to go, John Cross. Yeah, again, this was an early track I did. This is one of the... It, it, I think this song sounds like it's more about something than it actually is, uh, Part Machine, but... Um, I, again, it, this was this was uh, early on that I wrote. This was one of the older. This was one of the first block of like five songs I had for ages because I had five or six songs on my Bandcamp page for ages and ages and ages, and then nothing. And then I wrote a whole bunch of new material in the last sort of four or five months. Um, and uh, Part Machine, it's the well-worn um, car and or uh, um, some form of transport versus human metaphor thing um uh, but i loved the way the guitar sounded and i loved the way I, I made the voice sound i liked the little melody and i uh uh the lyrics pleased me enough that i put it all together but um i'm not entirely sure of like the the deep inspiration for it necessarily but it's a good fun track it is let's listen to some of that the wheels you got the lights they're shining chrome you got the wheels, you got the lights, you get home. Pot machine, now it's done and I'm pot machine. On the run, don't wanna be seen. Can still have fun, even though I'm pot machine. Good, good, good stuff. Good stuff. Do you Great know what melodies. I, do you know what I was thinking of? I was thinking of like Dirty World by the, the Traveling Wilburys. Do you know that song? I don't the, know that song. No. The song is basically they they had an, uh, a car magazine uh, uh -huh. in the studio, and it's George Harrison, Tom Petty, Bob Dylan, uh, uh, Roy Orbison, and so on. And they were taking phrases uh, about this car and using it in a sort of sexual sense or a, a lady sense or a female sense or a mate sense. Um, but they were going round the room and the, the song ends with, uh, like, he loves your five-speed gearbox. He loves your uh, big refrigerator or whatever it was. And it was uh -huh. like a song about a Winnebago or something. But they were, they were going round. And I just had this whole idea of, like, you know what? I could do my man as machine, uh, you know, mate as a car kind of metaphor song. It's about yeah. time I tackled one. So that's Every, kind of yeah, one of them. Everyone <laughs> needs at least one of those. There's limitless um, automotive metaphorical opportunities for songwriters. And uh, you just, you kind of have to do it. Especially in your, 
in your rootsy, bluesy, Americana sound that you have for a lot of these songs, it's if you didn't have a car, uh, yeah. it, it would have been a mistake. Well, that's the other thing. I'm a, I'm a lover of road movies or road stories. Yeah. And so, uh, and they crop up time and time again. And I do kind of play over the same themes. And this is definitely one of those where I'm like, this is, this is me as the machine that could take me across the country. You know, that kind of thing. And uh, that, that segues well into Percy, which is a road song too, correct? <laughs> Yeah, uh, Percy is, um, I mean, per- Percy is my road movie as as a uh, song and also uh, my theory of, you know, if all else fails, uh, get out there into the world, you know? Um, let, let's listen to a track and make sure we make it up. It's pretty early in the song, but make sure we make it up to the line don't you think the future is worth contemplating because it's remarkable that you are able to squeeze those words into the, into the beat. Uh, I'm like, I had to listen a few times through, just to be like, wait, what did he just say? Did that must've required a couple takes. Yes. Uh, if, let me think back. Probably. I mean, I do multiple takes on, on all the songs, but, uh, but probably this uh, again, this was all about the alliterative, songwriter this was all like how ludicrous can i be with this kind of thing with all the p's you know starting off with percy but but just all the 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 lines alliterating and it was sort of a bit of a fun you know i i read a lot of uh biographies and i i watch a lot of documentaries and uh when you watch like the beatles anthology which is something that i just watched endlessly when i was in my early teens because it would it screened in england in early 90s um you know, very often they would talk about writing a song, not because they had something to say, but because they were having fun with words or they were having fun with a technique or fun with a method or fun with a... Well, Percy's that. I just so happened to also whip in a bit of uh, road movie and a bit of uh, uh, personal uh, philosophy kind of mixed in there because that that stuff always comes out. Like, that's just your wheelhouse, so it, end, it ends up being where, where you live, you know. Um, but uh, it was a fun songwriting uh, uh, challenge. Um, as for fitting in that line, yeah, I think I just rattled it off and just kept going <laughs> and just hoped it worked. <laughs> All right. We haven't played it yet, have we? No, we'll play it no. now. Pussy poked his peepers from the hand of an ancient no world smacked him in the face like he was staring at creation. A little around the nightstand, talked of adventures, staying with liquor. But if she'd stayed, she was afraid he'd just try to drink her. And now she's on the highway with a thumb out trying to get to Michigan. He swears that's the last time he'll ever give a stranger a kiss again. I just want the open road, the light is low, my happiness is hell. The mountains grow up to meet him, to shield him from the smoking cities. He'll lick his home high up the phone, deep within Washington's trees. And all of the appeal, he could really feel when the stars are wrapped his belly was full with a good roadside meal. And sometimes in passing, he can picture the asking, wait. Okay, excellent work. Um, now, ladies and gentlemen, it's time to get the handkerchiefs out because this next track that I, I've highlighted on the album, John, I'm kind of focusing. I, I got some of the rockers, but it's some of the uh, the 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 tear jerkers that really um, have have stuck with me. Or, what did you think going into it? Did you which song? Did you think that people would react more to the? Uh, the down ones or the up ones, or did you even have it? What do you think? I I honestly didn't think the only, there was, I was listening to, and this is probably the biggest influence on the sad or the more personal songs. Cause they're they're necessarily sad. I try and whip some hope into everything, but uh, the, the, the more personal ones, the more obviously brazen uh, tracks, 
are heavily influenced by listening to or just finding again and discovering again the band The Mountain Goats. In which, oh, yeah, he, in yeah. which, good call. In which yeah. he seems to be absolutely fearless in, in what he writes about. Um, and uh, he also manages to have wonderful melody uh, without too many fancy chords. He's not whipping in diminished or minors or even uh, uh, sevens. He's just, he's got a great way of finding melody within three or four simple chords. Um, and there are a couple of tracks on the album that are heavily, heavily influenced by that. And I just said, uh, you know what? I'm at this place. If I don't write about it now and try and write about it a year, two years later, it's going to be phony. Sometimes you have to write this stuff. Um, let's do it in a way, uh, that, um, means something to me and that, that, that is, uh, inspired by something that, that got me through a lot of it, which is, is like the music of the mountain goats. So, uh, which track are you talking about? I just, Oh, is there no one? Yes. Um, I've yeah, yeah, that. yeah. 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 Um, yeah. Um, so before we hear it, a couple things, uh, first off, yeah, melodically, it's fantastic. You, you know, you, you is, is there no one, you, you just that phrase, is there no one you kind of sing in like two or three different, um, melodic ways throughout the song. And it's fantastic. It goes up sometimes it goes down sometimes. Um, and listen to this. These are my notes on, on the song. Um, <laughs> is there no one who will dance with me at 5 a.m.? Uh, spectacular melodies. Of course there's no one to dance with you. Go to bed. <laughs> but then, listen to this. Song is so good that I end up siding with the narrator, even though he's asking a lot of someone to dance with him at 5 <laughs> By the end of the song, I'm like, come on, dance with the guy. So you won, you won me over. My, my, um, you know, my sensible outlook was was totally um, changed by this this fantastic, um, sweet, you know, sweet. And, uh, you know, it's very open, just kind of like uh, um, letting the world be like, all right, you know, uh, I'm feeling a little lonely. And uh, yeah, here, and here we go. But it's also a flip on the usual. It's not a song about um, I want the great love or I'm looking for the one. It's yeah, just yeah. a song about, you know what, sometimes you just need – uh, someone, a little bit of companionship, and someone to just understand the moment. Right, um, you're you're not looking for the complication of um, long term relation, whatever that line is. It's good right, stuff. Right, right, yeah. right. Yeah, uh, yeah. Of like forced long term. Yes. Because I think this is the problem. Is a lot of of what I'm uh, come across this year has been people kind of. You know, I'm in my mid thirties, so it's not it's to be expected. But like uh, uh, a lot of the people I talk to, and this is just friends and or, or single people that I know, um, they're all hankering after that, like the one. And I, mm -hmm. I I've sort of uh, having been through what I've been through, I, I just kind of I've dropped that notion for the moment. And uh, it's just the idea of when you're, you know, you don't want a relationship, you're not looking for a, a girlfriend or a boyfriend or, or whatever it is. But you don't want to be alone either. It's like this yeah. weird thing. And you can lean on your friends to some extent, but you don't want to become that guy. You don't want to be yeah. like that lonely guy who just hangs around. Uh, you want uh, someone who gets it, someone who's just in that period of their life themselves and are happy to kind of, you know, be your hobo buddy. <laughs> well, I, I, have I have bad news for you, though. Um, w once the ladies hear this song... Um, they're going to be lining up not for the short-term relations, but they're they're going to sign on uh, full time, ladies and gentlemen. Let's listen to this that before and before we play the song. Uh, so, were, were the heat pipes were they causing a little racket during the recording process? Is that what that what, why you referenced that at the start? Yes, in my new uh, in my new apartment, there is a radiator right here, sat next to uh, where I am under the window, and again at around <laughs> four five a.m. <laughs> When this was recorded, by the way, this is one of those songs. The reason why the heat pipes come on. First of all, it was like beginning to be winter because this was recorded, I think, fairly late last year mm -hmm. um, before I put the album out. It was one of a block of about four or five songs that I wrote very quickly at the end of last year. Um, the heat pipes were coming on at three or four in the morning to combat the cold here in New York. Uh, but it was also one of those songs that I, I, I wrote uh, again at around 2 a.m., 3 a.m., and was like, I can't wait to record this. I can't, mm -hmm. I can't put this song down and come back to it tomorrow when it's more suitable. So the reason why it has the sound that it has 
is that the mic is up very loud. The gain is up very loud on the mic. And I'm singing very quietly. And I'm playing yeah. the ukulele very quietly. Uh, but the mic is picking it all up. So the reason why I say, oh, it's the heat pipes is because you can occasionally hear like, or something during the song. <laughs> and I love that, man. I, I absolutely yeah. love it. I think it makes the track. Yeah, and it's a great performance because because you're trying to be quiet and you're trying not to wake people up, then it makes it even more uh, more of a convincingly emotional performance. So let's hear it, ladies and gentlemen. Um, is there no one? Will no one dance with me in the small house? Just to stave off the decay. Are you worried that I might get the wrong idea? Or are you worried what the neighbors may say? I've had enough. I give up from this moment I might as well. Let the whole world go to hell Do what I want And how I want to Gotta go down with a grin And to destroy myself within Is there no one who will hold me in the morning? All I want is to be happy. I don't want the... All right, so now the people are just weeping. They're just <laughs> all just weeping. The ladies, um, if, John, if you want to give out your phone number, I'm, I'm, just, I'm just saying, uh, the ladies, ladies, my phone number is 603-644-0048. Call me or text me, and I will pass this, um, pass your message on to John. Well, you can call the After Movie Diner on 347-669-0053. That's the official After Movie Diner uh, <laughs> <laughs> voicemail number. What a what a love connection! What a way for uh, for a relationship to start. This is delightful. No, I'm not looking for a relationship. <laughs> <laughs> That's what they all say. Yeah. So, so now um, you're really you're you deal with the same uh, same idea here. I get. Well, is there no one? I guess is you're alone and lonely. I had you is it's in it's over song. I guess uh, you know. So it, I guess it's a different theme. Um, but and it's definitely a, a different musical experience. This is a, um, I imagine like the traveling Wilburys like up on stage rocking out to this song and like you know when two singers are singing into the same microphone. Yes. That's what I. But while strumming guitars, you know. Yeah. And I had you till I no longer had you. Uh, that's that's what I imagine. And it, you know, the whole audience singing along because this is <laughs> this song is an anthem and. This is the number one stuck in my head song. Is this now? This um, wh when did you write this one? And and how happy were you <laughs> after you wrote it? You must have been like, ooh, I just wrote an anthem. Uh, I was happiest after I recorded it. The song doesn't fully like come uh, come to me until it's all put together in in, the, in all the layers. And when I listened back to it, I was like, okay, now I have something. And there's only a couple of times that's ever happened. There was a. There's an album I did with my friend John, which I did by mail, uh, well, not by mail, by email, back and forth. He recorded his vocal or guitar or whatever track in London and I, whatever, and we went back and forth. And that's available on Bandcamp. But on that album, uh, we did a song called um, Stupid Remakes, which I've played on the diner before. And that was a Wilbury esque track, traveling Wilbury esque track where I was specifically trying to get a sound. And at the end of the song, I don't know how I did it, but I got the sound. Mm -hmm. And then there's another song on uh, one of the Crowd That Entertains albums where, again, we wanted a certain sound and somehow I got the sound. I Had You was like that, like putting it together and putting the layers together. Uh, I mean, it's a fun song to play just on a guitar, but like once I put it all together and then I found that great trumpet noise and, and I, I, I put it uh, had the refrain at the end where I was like... 
um, uh, I had you, and then I realized I could then flip that and say, well, one of us has been had, uh, which I really liked. I mean, it's kind mm -hmm. of a, it's kind of a bit of a dig line, and I don't really mean it as a dig line. I like, I just enjoyed the play on words. Um, and then uh, uh, once I put it all together, I was, it was, it was definitely one of those tracks where I was like, that's it. That's if I could do that every song out the gate, I, I feel like I would be a millionaire. <laughs> but, yeah. Well, I think the hardest thing to do in a in a home recording setup is um, is something with a lot of layers. You mm -hmm. know, I I find because. It just tends to get muddled uh, for me more often than not. The more layers I add on there, this feels like it's got a lot of layered layers, but um, but it does, but it's not muddled at all. It, it's it 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 you uh, well it's well mixed, and that trumpet um, sounds like a real trumpet. I yeah. <laughs> Totally thought you had a, you know, that your roommate uh, played trumpet or something. I was like, yeah, there's trumpet. This is great. <laughs> it's got great lines. Everything up till now has been a botch experiment. That's a great line. I haven't meant a single word I've said, and yet I've meant every single word is a really good line, too. Um, you know, it's... Well, um, that comes from that moment where... And I'm going to get a bit personal on you, Matt. But that, that comes I on love that, personal. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. That comes from that moment where... You're, and I don't, I don't imagine you've ever... Had, I mean, maybe you have. Maybe there's a dark side to Matt Farley. <laughs> but I imagine you're a permanently, like, upbeat, funny guy. And even if you get a bit low, you're like, nah, fuck it, I'm going to record another hundred songs about, you know, Scarlett Johansson farts or something. But, uh, which would be amazing, by the way. I could go for a whole album about that. Um, but um, when when you're down and you're, you're, you're emotional and you're uh, um, uh, sharing... When you're down, you're emotional, and you're sharing your uh, uh, feelings with a friend, uh, especially when you get dramatic with it. I have the tendency, obviously, in my temperament or whatever, to be a bit melodramatic. And um, you're saying a lot of things that feel really true at the moment and really um, negative and despair-filled and upsetting at the moment. And in the moment, you mean every single bit of it. Mm -hmm. But in your day-to-day -day life, you don't mean any of it. It's all just uh, uh, cathartic baggage you throw out during a, a, a confessional moment. But in that confessional moment, you really mean it. So that line is is trying to explain anyone who's ever experienced depression and anyone who's tried to share that with someone, either a shrink or a friend or a family member – there, people will say the worst things in arguments or the worst things at moments of upset or despair that they don't mean at all. But at that moment, it feels absolutely true, you know. Uh, yeah, so any... you can, yeah, you can simultaneously feel one way and the opposite way, mm -hmm. I think is what, what you're saying there. You know, yeah. you can have have both both thoughts at the same time and uh and, and, and what's what's interesting about the song is i was listening to it again the other day and i realized that the first verse is absolutely about nothing and then the uh -huh. second verse and the third verse and then obviously the chorus and stuff is about uh, uh what the song is actually about but the first verse is 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 about nothing it's just some cute lines put together i don't know why i then suddenly decided in the maybe i wrote the first verse had the experience that the second verse is about and then wrote the second verse and went, ah, sod it, it'll, it'll just all go together, you know. It, well, it does. Uh, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, let's listen to this. Let's play uh, a good chunk of I Had You. Uh, get ready to rock. Throat rasping, hands grasping, tiny squeaks and screams into the darkness. I haven't meant a single word I've said and yet I've meant every single word. Like a stunt fighter beneath a helicopter Without even a harness Let the neighbors sometimes be disturbed When I had you Till I no longer had you Well, you went with me as far as you could go When it was meant to be on the Guess that when you know, you really know. Then what felt like no time at all it turned out to be forever. Nothing but my stomach had been settled. I left at first light, just as the crisper began to bite. I fight to hold on to the value. I 
I've John actually Cox. just played the whole song. Is what I've just done. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The people need the people need to hear the whole thing. Uh, um, so um, th- those are my highlights. The whole album's fantastic. It's called Catch Up or Don't. See if I care. And um, now listen, all you people listening to the After Movie Diner, just accepting entertainment on an almost weekly basis from John Cross, um, pay him back, okay? Pay the poor guy back by buying this album on iTunes, buying it on Amazon. It's by Miscellaneous Plumbing Fixtures. Um, Or, you know what? Just listen to it on Spotify. Uh, It's free to listen to. And John is going to collect a tiny fraction of a of a penny each with each song you listen to. And the the, the beauty of it is, uh, if you do listen to it on Spotify, you're going to end up listening to it like um, twenty times because because it's that good. And let's just do a, a quick math uh, here, John. There's how many songs on the on the album? Sixteen songs. On Sixteen that. times twenty. If you listen to it, um, <laughs> it'll earn John. <laughs> Like two bucks. A dollar. A dollar sixty. A dollar sixty. Just listen to the album twenty times. <laughs> It'll earn John a dollar. A dollar. Actually, I, I've changed my mind. Buy the album on iTunes. It's the least you can do. And and it's it's homemade art, which is so much uh, better than um, than corporate produced art. And that's what you know. The diner. The beauty of the diner is uh, he, John examines uh, the big movies and the little movies. And uh, definitely, he 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 shines a light on on movies like Don Dollar's movies and, and my movies that don't get much attention. So not only is he um, is he shining lights on these works of art, he's making some of his own. And um, and uh, John, you know, you're a humble guy, and uh, I'm glad you allowed me to uh, tell the world how great your album is. Well, yeah, I mean, I, you know, there was, there was a big part of me that was like, oh, because when we first talked about doing the interview about the album, which I wanted to do, because I do, I do seriously want to plug this. It is, it is something that I'm finally putting my uh, uh, um, my pride behind, or my my. Uh, I do genuinely like the album, um, which is an awkward position for me to be in because it's not 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 really where I sit comfortably, but. Uh, when I first talked about doing the interview, I was like, oh, yeah, you can talk about the album and I'll just be silly and I'll come up with any things about it. And you were like, no, no, no let's do a, a proper interview about it. And, you know, I was thinking about it and I was thinking, well, I don't know about that. And I don't know whether people will care, or blah, 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 or whether it just be a big, long advert for the album. And then I thought to myself, well, wait a minute. Uh, I've had shows which have been interviews just like solely to 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 advertise a person or, or a book or a movie yeah. or something like that, um, and uh, I've I've only ever done uh, little adverts at the beginning of the show for the various things that I do, and a lot of people have said to me. Can you just put the adverts at the end of your podcast? Like I'm, I don't want to hear the adverts. I want to get straight to the podcast, uh, which I understand. But I'm like, look, man, you know, like we've all got to earn a living, or or, or at least uh, uh, get our, our stuff out there in some way. Uh, yeah. No one's getting rich off this. We just yeah. want to. Uh, <laughs> These entitled <laughs> entitled listeners. It's like, yeah, come on, I want my free entertainment. Could, um, could you put the ads at the end where I can ignore them and not <laughs> listen to them? Well, um, I would say if one out of every 150 of your episodes includes a um a plug of an album then you're being pretty you're 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 being pretty humble. So Well, uh, I, I literally I have to say and I'm not I'm not giving you false props here, but listening to the uh, infomercial podcast, the Moton Media infomercial podcast, which by the way I love, it just continues to be like one of my favorite hours of of listening. It's just thanks. good times to spend time with you and hear your songs and hear your friends chat and stuff like that. Endlessly interesting and entertaining if people aren't listening to it um but it was listening to that where i'm like you know what i know matt's doing it like half and half tongue in cheek and half and half like he really feels it this is something i really feel like this album i really feel and uh, so yeah i'm sorry if you had to listen to me for a, a, a listeners for an hour plugging this thing uh but uh i i dig this album this is me being like you know what i did something in it if this is what comes out of 2014 the 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 quagmire of, of despair that was 2014 for me then then hallelujah this is the the joyous thing that can come out of that thing without playing the whole tortured artist card because i'm not doing that at all i'm as happy oh, as oh yeah X-Men. yeah well uh, tortured i'm anti-tortured artist but i'm not i'm not suggesting that there's uh, no such thing as heart 
heartbreak in in life. Right, and, right, right. and you can turn heartbreak into art without being a tortured artist, for sure. And I would say you uh, you definitely accomplished that. I, I do feel like, though, that I wrote 16 songs and haven't even accomplished what you did with Hair on the Sweater. I found your hair on the sweater. <laughs> I think that song encompasses my whole album in one and a half minutes. And I think it only has one line, right? I found her hair on my sweatshirt last night and I felt so very sad. (laughs) (laughs) But that's it. If you want this album in a nutshell, it's that line. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, new plan. Forget about miscellaneous plumbing (laughs) fixtures. Look up I found her hair on her sweatshirt last night by Moe's Haven. That's... um, it has it has made John's entire album uh, redundant. <laughs> it really has. <laughs> Just kidding. Now, um, and and now, it, I, I enjoyed taking over the diner, but I'm going to hand it back over to you. Okay. And so. uh, you, you, this is uh, your show again. So yeah, uh, all the links to the album uh, will be on the post for this week's uh, diner show, uh, and has been uh, the last three or four diner shows since December. Uh, they've all had links to where you can find the album. Uh, I'll tell everyone that it is cheapest and gets to me quickest via Bandcamp. Uh, but I have had people go, I don't know what Bandcamp is. I want it on iTunes. So that's why it's on iTunes, because someone said to me, I don't know what Bandcamp is. I don't want to give them my uh, credit card. So I'm like, well, it's a legitimate where it's a very legitimate website. There are famous people on Bandcamp. But if you're not uh, happy with that, it is available on iTunes, Amazon, Google Play, Spotify, SoundCloud, anywhere the music is available. Uh, you can hear the whole album as many times as you like on Spotify. Uh, but the hope is that you, you go out and pick it up. And... As a bonus, if you're thinking, oh, there's all this weighty uh, subject matter on uh, uh, Catch Up or Don't See If I Care, then uh, there are 20 uh, joyously silly tracks about actors and film directors uh, under the uh, songs about them what make movies, uh, which is also available on Spotify. Take a listen and you would be in uh, good company. Um, because uh, <laughs> James Glickenhaus, the notoriously awesome 80s and 90s action film director, James uh, the Gl- Glickenhaus, uh, d- Googled himself, must have Googled himself, must have Googled the song, somehow found the song on SoundCloud and posted it all over his Facebook and his Facebook pages because he, he runs, uh, he builds Ferraris and uh, uh, um, builds cars for racetracks now as, 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 and all, as well as working for a big company in the city that was owned by his father. And uh, he, because uh, he's given up movie making for the moment, and uh, uh, he posted it all over the pages. So car fanatics have listened to my song. <laughs> that's yeah, that's about fantastic. James House, which is awesome. It's had 127 listens on SoundCloud. I wish that had been Spotify, but sadly he shared the SoundCloud link. But uh, there it is. James Glickenhaus has done it. So why don't you do it? Uh, as well as the producer uh, for the uh, smash B movie hit Stranded, starring Christian Slater. <laughs> He found my song, Christian, the Christian Slater song, Stranded, from the movie Stranded, Shut Them Doors, in, in brackets, uh, which is the name of the song. He found that, loves it, says that he wrote me an email, says that he's listened to it a hundred times with a smile on his face. So why don't you do the same on Spotify? I'm not begging that people buy that album. It is available on iTunes and Amazon, but I'd much rather people go out and buy uh, Catch Up or Don't See If I Care. But listen to that on Spotify as a treat for yourself an extra 20 songs which you can just enjoy and laugh and kick back on i would also recommend the cynthia rothrock song some great piano loops on there that i uh, stole off garage band <laughs> a couple of things one it's pretty awesome that uh within a week of your debut release you already released the follow-up <laughs> <laughs> well, that came from that came from your interview with uh, Millhouse G, where he said he put the same song on like five different <laughs> albums. I already had for sale on Bandcamp. You can buy every song and almost every promo and ditty and everything that's ever appeared on the Diner on the Diner Ditties page on Bandcamp. There's three albums. There's like thirty tracks on each album, and each album's like five bucks. It's such a good deal. If you want the uh, After Movie Diner musical catalog. That's the place to go. Five bucks an album. Pick it up on Bandcamp. It's great. But I had so much fun 
uh, putting stuff on iTunes and Amazon and the, the, the distribution that I'm using allows me to put up as many songs as I want, but I only have it for a year. I only have it for 12 months. Um, mm-hmm. unless I choose to renew. So I want to put up as much as I can, but I don't want to swamp everything. But I wanted people to have a serious album and a joke album. They can pick one and buy one, or whatever their tastes are. And I put together, I realized that out of the Dino Diddies, I could put together 20 tracks that were just about actors and just about directors without you having to know some obscure B-movie I'm singing about or some random scene that the song is about. So I put them all together and I changed the name so that it is the John Cusack song, the Cynthia Rothrock song, the Christian Slater song, um, so that uh, people know what they're getting, right? This is a song about Lucio Fulci. This is a song about Rutger Hauer. Uh, who doesn't love Rooker Howe? Like, why aren't you listening to that track right now? Rooker Howe's a legend. Go listen to the Rooker Howe song. There's two versions of it. You can have the full band version and the ukulele version. <laughs> listen to both. The ukulele version is fantastic, but the full band version, it's fantastic. It rhymes the word Rooker Howe with as many words that rhyme with how as possible. Uh, <laughs> it's fantastic. Hour, flower. It's all in there. You'll love it. It's a great song. Go do that as well. Treat um, yourself. And I'll tell you, I don't know, like, well, I, when, it, when an album is on iTunes and Spotify and Amazon, um, people take notice much more than if it's just on SoundCloud or Bandcamp. Be, and even though it doesn't necessarily cost all that much or take that much effort to get it onto these other sites, it just gives you a little bit of cachet. And, um, and I think it's, I'm glad you put it up on those. I listen on Spotify, so it's way easier for me to stream your stuff on Spotify Right. Um, on my, my music setup than it would be uh, anything else. So it's good that you got it up there. And it tricks, you know, I do it too. It tricks people into thinking you're more legitimate than, than you actually are um, when, when you put them on these sites. Yeah, and it, it, it was a great... Uh, I'm using DistroKid. Uh, they're great um, uh, in terms of, like, getting the albums out there. They've been very good. They have a good customer service that I spoke to and everything like that. Um uh, but they only do a yearly subscription thing. So yeah. uh, eventually I would end up spending way too much on it, I would imagine. But um, if this year, this is my guinea pig year, if this year these albums are a success, then uh, who knows? I might be gunning for your uh, uh, CD baby thing and putting them up on there. Yeah, well, yeah. well I'm very curious to see how DistroKid works for you too, You know, just to see what uh, the different options are. So that's pretty cool. Well, yeah, the difference is, is you pay whatever it is, 40-something or 50-something, but then that album is up for life. For, uh, yeah. Whereas but, I pay $20, and it's only up for a year. So. Yeah, but, I mean, think of that. $20 a year over the course of uh, 10 years, you've only spent 200 bucks. That's on CD Baby. That's the, the how much it would cost to put up um, the four, o- a, four the, albums. The, <laughs> o- the other problem with you is is you would have to have everything under Moten Media because – they right. don't allow different band names unless yeah. you go for like DistroKid Pro or whatever. And I think mm-hmm. that's more like 50, 60 bucks a year. And, um, yeah. well, so I can, and that's the other thing is I was forced to keep miscellaneous plumbing fixtures as the name. So all albums that will be on iTunes, Amazon, blah, 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 will all be under miscellaneous plumbing fixtures. Even though it's a little clunky, and even though I wish I'd maybe just gone for John Cross, ah, to hell with it. That's what it is now. People learn it. Learn how to spell miscellaneous. It's a great <laughs> word to spell. It's a great word to say. Uh, people need to figure this stuff out. Come on, people. Be grown-ups. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, you ready to discuss? Yes. Uh, we're we're going to do... discuss a couple of movies about uh, – I, I call them a couple of movies about um... – Failed artists from the 80s. <laughs> yeah, basically. Um, uh, one is the infamous Ishtar, uh, which I was, I, I have, as I said on your show, have been uh, uh, dying to watch since a friend of mine had the VHS back in high school. But because everyone had told me, ah, it's a, it's a failed movie, don't bother watching it, uh, I didn't see it. I should have learned from Howard the Duck and the Adventures of Baron Munchausen that these big flops. They can sometimes yield gems, so I should have learned. I was a moron. Um, I finally got around to watching it. How bad could a, an Elaine May joint with uh, uh, Warren Beatty and Dustin Hoffman be? How bad, really? It's not bad at all. There, there is no bad. So uh, that's great. And then we're also covering uh, the Chevy Chase starring vehicle Funny Farm, uh, which is about an author who escapes the countryside to write the great novel, but doesn't. <laughs> three, two, three. 
three, four, four, two, three, and... These men are pawns. I put the price of 20,000 dirham on their heads. Next, they will be hailed as the true messenger of God. They were just a couple of songwriters who came to Ishtar to break into show business. Easy, easy, boy, easy, boy. Easy, boy. What the hell's the matter with him? Is he blind? Well, yeah, he is, but, but he's in perfect condition. So how do they wind up on everyone's hit list? Your life is in danger. Behave normally. We have a gun pointed at your back. No, don't put your hands up, you idiot. My little darling. My little darling. I can't believe these men may control the fate of the Middle East. This is unbelievable. Are the two American messengers of God dead yet? This is the oasis. The Does oasis. this look like an oasis to you? Yeah, look at the birds. Are those vultures? Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, just... oh, are you? He's aiming at it. Will you stop me? Warren Beatty, Dustin Hoffman, Isabella Johnny. Your girl! How did she get to be your girl? Only you! I think they're wonderful. Ishtar, written and directed by Elaine May. <laughs> this is some of our best work. Um... Uh. So for for Ishtar, at first it's a lesson in in gossip, really. Um, right. It, it was just gossip among Hollywood people that the movie was a big mess. They, they spent a lot of money on it, and that is all anyone focused on when they reviewed it. And it be, and it was and it became a flop because of all the 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 negative talk about it. And it's just it's just silly. I mean, who who cares what went into the creation of the movie? Just look at the movie but it seems that nobody really did and you know uh, there, there's a, a small faction of people that i'm trying to rally together who recognize that this is it's a flawed movie for sure but there are brilliant moments in this film especially the first 20 minutes john tell me what did you think watching those 20 minutes yeah well just to comment quickly on what you were saying you're absolutely right you couldn't get a film more vibrant and creative than Baron Munchausen, but the story on that film was always like, oh, 40 million over budget and blah, 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 and this, that, and everything else, and the producers ran out, and Terry Gilliam's a madman, and blah, 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 blah. But if you shut all that out and watch Baron Munchausen, fucking incredible movie, uh, so on. The same goes for Ishtar. There is a lot of stories about what went into the movie, uh, and it's hilarious because everyone is on the movie, if you read the backstory, to support Elaine May, especially the producer star Warren Beatty. He did it because he was like, I want to give Elaine May the chance to write and direct. But then apparently hampered her at every turn as a producer. I'm like, <laughs> dude, give her the chance to write and direct and then take yourself out of the equation. Like, why are you trying to write and direct this movie? So this is clearly what was going on behind. If you read the, 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 the trivia on IMDb, it's clear. And Dustin Hoffman is trying to go, listen, Warren, Elaine, calm the, <laughs> calm the fuck down. Let's just make this movie. But anyway, a bunch of stuff goes on behind the scenes. Who cares? Uh, it's a story about uh, two guys who are not like when you told me oh it's about two songwriters who just write these like crazily bad songs or or, or uh, cumbersome songs let's say or uh, interesting songs um i thought they were like actual songwriters it's even better than that folks it's it's they are two guys who always had a dream yes. uh, without the talent to back the dream up but it doesn't matter. They still have the dream. They have the dream with all the fervor and passion that Paul McCartney has a dream. It doesn't matter. And uh, uh, all they want to do, uh, to the detriment of relationships and jobs <laughs> and everything, is write songs. But they have no uh, discernible skill in terms of writing songs. Although I have to say... Their hit single, uh, and you're going to have to remind me which one Telling it is. Telling the truth can be dangerous business. Oh, man. That is fantastic. And if you play an accordion, <laughs> you can't be part of my rock and roll band. Uh, Listen, if you admit that you, yeah, yeah, so if good. If you admit you can play, how little did they know 
skip forward 20 years. Everyone who plays an accordion in a rock and roll <laughs> band now. Everything's Mumford and Sons, right? Everything's You're accordions right. and banjos. So uh, little did they know, if you play an accordion, you can be in a rock and roll band. What is it? I think they're wonderful. Telling the truth can be dangerous business. Honest and popular don't go hand in hand. If you admit that you can play the accordion, no one will hire you in a rock and roll band. But we can sing. Just wonderful, and they're doing all the tropes of um, in the first opening twenty minutes. This glorious twenty minutes, they're doing all the tropes of um, the artists. They're pacing around their apartment. They're like wearing mad clothes. They're they're drinking in like bars at like two a.m. trying to like get that that uh, the juices going. Uh, they're, the Dustin Hoffman's job of playing at an old people's home uh, is. Is fantastic and uh, wonderful, and of course mirrors a lot of your own experience in in you know old people's homes and, and youth youth homes and things like that. So it's funny as well. Uh, yeah, and um, I'll tell you, um, at, obviously it's a little over the top um, and showing how they're how bad they are. But there have been many moments in my songwriting, especially collaboration moments, when I'm collaborating with someone and watching Ishtar, and I'm like. Oh, I've been I've been there. <laughs> you oh, know, yeah. where you you're just c- coming up, you know, and and like Warren Beatty is saying like it's a bitter herb and uh and and Hoffman's like there's never been a hit song with herb in it. <laughs> <laughs> Enough with the herb. And right. it, it just in in the editing in that opening 20 minutes is so good. It is it just it it flows wonderfully and it it flashes back and it flashes forward and it gives you little snippets of the songs that they're writing. It is brilliantly written brilliantly acted the su- it's hilarious hilarious and i admire these these two characters too because yeah, in the completely. in the face of, of 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 no one liking them they're still they just like we're songwriters and and the movie i and <laughs> dustin a, hoffman calling himself the hawk i love the hawk. <laughs> Uh, like in Warren Beatty's writing uh, is an ice cream truck driver and, and he's so busy composing a song called <laughs> hot fudge love that he, he doesn't even notice the kids are lining up for ice cream. Uh, there's so many moments. It, it's so wonderfully written. You see yeah. in this, in this little 20 minute uh, segment, you see how they meet, you see how they collaborate, you see how they both lose their, their girlfriends or, or wives because they're so focused on their music Hoffman uh, attempts suicide, which, which is hilarious when he's up on the uh, on the ledge, and, and even Rabbi Pierce is there to try to uh, well, talk Hoff, him down. Hoffman is the Hoffman is the pretentious one. He's the one with the ego, and Warren Beatty is the wide eyed uh, uh, believer, true believer. Yeah, um, I mean they're both they're both, uh, they're both um, uh, genuinely deluded about their their talent. Um, which is joyous that people should be um, yes. <laughs> about that. <laughs> I mean, look, Miley Cyrus is insanely deluded about her talent, as is the rest of the world. So, listen, I would rather a million of, of these guys than one Miley Cyrus. I would listen to uh, the uh, uh, um, the song "Telling the Truth" and be dangerous business a <laughs> hundred times over from whatever you know song about her vagina she's singing this week so uh <laughs> definitely but uh um uh, he is definitely the ego uh hoffman is and bt yeah. the kind of wide-eyed follower so what he's doing when he goes to pretend to commit suicide is that he sat on the ledge with his phone calling bd to be like oh i'm out on my ledge i don't know what i'm going to do but please don't call the police because he's not yeah. really trying to commit suicide at yeah. all but then when the police show up and Biddy shows up he has to go out on the ledge just to prove that what he's doing is really <laughs> trying to kill himself even though he had no intention whatsoever <laughs> and then the rabbi shows up his parents show up everyone shows up and it's it's uh it's wonderful it's hilarious yeah some great B- bd gives some great lines um on that ledge scene he says uh it takes a lot of nerve to have nothing at your age yeah, most yeah. guys most 
those guys would be ashamed. What a great line. I love it. And then you'd rather have nothing than settle for less. And it's like, <laughs> ah, like it's hilarious and it's strangely inspiring. That should be a song title. I'm surprised they don't turn, you know, you've, uh, um, you're happy to have nothing rather than settle for less. I'm surprised they didn't turn that into a song. That would have been well, amazing. Mose Haven has um, since done that. Since so. done that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and, I, and in fact, the, the, I want to live a life of quiet desperation. Uh, the song <laughs> of yours is, is clearly from this. this uh, no, I hadn't seen this chair yet when we wrote that. That's funny. Are you serious? I'm not. I'm yeah, totally serious. Yeah. Oh wow. Okay. Yeah. Because that's I, obviously a refrain throughout this film as well. I, it, yeah, it's great. Now another thing that I love is when they're um, they're in the restaurant when they first met and they're collaborating for what seems to be hours and the guys trying to close the restaurant and saying <laughs> you got to leave and, and and they say just give me another hour and the guy goes give me another give me a half an hour like the last half hour and then they <laughs> then they start writing a song give me half a hour like the last half hour. Yeah. And it's just, it's so great just to see them turning every little mundane thing into a, into a, a horrible and hilarious song. It's, it's, uh, it's amazing. Oh, I love the Bud, what was Freed? What's the, oh, uh, Marty Freed, the, uh, oh, the agent. Yeah, yeah, such yeah. a great character, that guy. And they, again, they completely buy into him and, and what he's able to do, but he's clearly like this, this mad sleaze pot agent who, who, you know, uh, ends up sending people to Azerbaijan or whatever, you know, to, <laughs> to do a, to do a live setting in a place. And I love, uh, there's, there's so many things in the, in the film that I really like, but I mean, <clears throat> The, the male bonding aspect, I'm a big fan of, 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 of male bonding. You know, th there are lots and lots and lots of movies, I think, about, uh, uh, um, you know, women's friendships and groups of women and TV shows about groups of women and, and blah, 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 blah. Um, and there's plenty of films, to be fair, about male bonding. But, but this in particular speaks to me, and I think it obviously speaks to you, too, about, about you know, you find someone who, who either likes what you do or wants to do it, too, or someone you can be uh, 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 free with create creatively, even if you have a really silly idea, uh, uh, you can go ahead and say it to that other person and they don't immediately shoot you down or laugh you off. That's, that's a great, great moment. And that's a great friendship right there. And I love the way that that's, that's born in this movie. Um, and I also like, like we've talked about before with your songs and you know, uh, where, where there's been criticism and we've gone, but hang on a second. Any topic is good for a song. I don't care. Like the Beatles sang Octopus's Garden, uh, yeah. you know, which is nonsense. And, and just because th there is a line, there is a line that says the poetry of a song like A Day in the Life by the Beatles, which was headlines picked out of a newspaper that they put together. Yeah. That works. And listening to a guy who goes half hour like the last half hour and then going half hour like the last half hour doesn't work. There is a fine line about it and we don't know what it is. But I love that they're exploring that, that line. Yeah, cause... push the limit because there's enough songs about going to the club, you know? Right, right, right. W which is the, the subject of every pop song currently uh, on the airwaves. It yeah, seems. or look at my butt or whatever it is. There's enough now... songs about butts, people. <laughs> Now you 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 talked about the the bonding and these two characters and I think that's where the movie kind of the movie goes wrong after that first 20 minutes there's there's a good chunk that it of boringness I think really from that moment to when they buy the blind camel um there there's a few peaks but it's mostly valleys and part of it is because they separate Beatty and Hoffman quite a lot yeah. once they once they get to the Middle East and so that's that's a problem right there because What's beautiful about this movie is the two guys, and also they're not writing songs together anymore uh, for for that whole section right. in the middle. Right. Uh, and and the plot is just very convoluted. And well, she's trying to do a road movie. You know, Bob Hope and uh, I forget the other guy who's in those road movies. Bing, Bing, Bing Crosby. Crosby that's yeah. it. Right. Right. Crosby and Hope road movies. That's what she's trying to do uh, with with Beatty and Hoffman. And uh, there's, there's two interesting things about that. Uh, first of all, it's clearly in the construction of the script that um, there aren't enough knockabout one-liners and they're not being put upon as a pair um, to compare to the, 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 the Crosby Hope uh, road movies. Uh, so therefore, the, the plot, the twisty-turny uh, CIA uh, insurgent terrorist-like twisty-turny plot is, is all a bit 
too much for the movie to bear because there aren't a movie like this would only work if if there was quick fire quick patter i'm thinking woody allen in love and death kind of yeah kind of stuff and look woody allen in love and death he's admitted he steals those things from bob hope uh, this doesn't have enough of that that's yeah. the and one these guys thing. aren't that smart either too you know so it's like they're, right. they're not they're not even those characters aren't witty enough to even have come well, up with a Bob it, Hope style line. Yeah, either. it's too complicated a a a, a plot for uh, you're trying to follow this plot and you're not getting engrossed in the farce comedy or double act anymore. That's that's what ends up happening and that's why it gets a bad rap. Yeah, and and what what a shame because uh, I don't. I think maybe they didn't even know what they had because, from what I read, um, all the New York scenes were filmed after all the desert stuff. Right. So it's like they filmed this mess out in the desert, and then they come to New York and film this masterpiece about two songwriters, and then they they put them together. Uh, I want. I am. I, I imagine that perhaps originally that the opening part was a lot even a lot smaller, but they just had to. They made it longer because. It was the it was it was so much better than everything else they had. Yeah, I mean the three best bits in the movie, the peaks for me are the are the first twenty the New York bits. Yeah. Um, the blind camel bit, which is unbelievably funny because it's an obvious joke. Like I knew when he showed up at the camel market and asked for Mohammed that everyone would be called yeah. Mohammed. Yeah. And uh, I knew that uh, 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 when he tried to buy a blind camel, he would actually get a blind camel. But the fact that then he is leading this blind camel through and they're unaware that it is knocking people over and knocking stuff over in genuinely comedic timing, funny ways... I was laughing out loud at that. That whole bit where Hoffman's dragging the camel just and people are falling off stuff. It's naked gun, it's it's Prattfuls, it's Laurel and Hardy, it's 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 brilliant. It's it's all those things and it's really well done. And then the third peak for me is when they regain the songwriting thread in the desert. Yes. And that whole bit about the pen we don't need no pencil. Oh, like that's I the best it. line uh, so We didn't good. even need a pencil. Right, oh, right, right. It's- it's so uh, one thing I want to mention is when he's talking about the blind camel, he says, "I can't hold her too tight because it hurts her tooth." You know, like he knows he knows already that uh, you know she's got a bad tooth and stuff. It just it was a funny little line, throwaway line that uh, right. that cracked me up a little bit. But yeah, and that's the thing: if the two of them had been had if in each adventure that they uh, happen into, if they. It, if that was inspiring them to write more songs, if that was uh, the thread all the way through, then it would have it would have taken your attention away from the convoluted plot, it, you know, right. and had fun. The only in so there's like a good forty five minutes of, you know, of where it's pretty stale in the middle. The only time like uh, Grodin, I, I like Grodin. Grodin does a good job, and, and there's some good lines. The yeah, Charles he just Grodin. doesn't. He just doesn't have much funny stuff to do. But Grodin is always a welcome presence. I love him on screen. Yeah, and there's you know there's a moment where he says they signed a pack with Gaddafi and um and Hoffman's like is that near here you know yeah 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 so there's some funny back and forth I like it but again well, you the gotta look get on, the look on Grodin's face when he realizes he's dealing with a dumbbell is pretty amazing because he thinks he's just another American tourist that he can maybe play and and get on his side and get give him some money and whatever and then if he has to eliminate him so what but there's that moment like you say when he says oh is Gaddafi near here. Uh, where he suddenly realizes, and then a look goes across Grodin's face, where he's like, oh, no, what have <laughs> I done? Which is so Grodin, it's fantastic as well. Then. But it should have been the both of them. They don't, you know, these two characters are so great together that it's a shame that so much of the plot hinged on them not trusting each other for, for a while and being separated. So, But, but then, you know, uh, once they get the blind camel, it's like the movie just completely... Um, is reinvigorated and they they start writing like you say they start writing songs in the desert um the uh, you know the the auctioneer scene that's it's pretty funny you know i, I kind of like that where they think um yeah Hoffman's i mean i'm sure auctioneer. i'm sure now it would be on pc or some crap but uh, yeah that is funny with him trying to pretend to be a, a translator of all these different uh, desert dialects and not knowing any of them um, but but having BT as a plant in the group, yeah, it so was, that BT can go, oh yeah, that's whatever he's saying is right, and like pointing and shouting and giving the illusion of of stuff happening, you know. But uh, 
And now, uh, one, I don't think I said this yet, but like a big picture uh, look at the movie, tell me if I already said this, but is um, if, you, <laughs> if you follow your dream, especially in middle age, um, there's a good chance you're going to end up in the desert shooting at helicopters. Right. <laughs> <laughs> like, you know what I mean? Like, it's like a cautionary tale. Don't, don't try to become the, the songwriter that you think you'll always be, might be because this is, this is what the world has in store for you. You know, it, 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 I, you know, I just kind of like to look at it that way because, um, you know, it's like anytime you try to insert some excitement into your life or, or to do what you really want to do, things can go tragically wrong. And uh, uh, that's just one interpretation I had. Yeah, I think it's uh, the biggest problem with the movies. Is it's it's trying to be three different movies, um, and there's also maybe, and this is not speaking to how I felt about the film, but speaking to maybe how audiences at the time felt about the film. There's maybe something to do with the obvious switch casting of Hoffman as the lady killer and BT as like the simple minded yeah. side guy. Cause that was in, not necessary at all. In for real, them to do that. But in real life, BT was the lady killer right. and, and Hoffman has played more kind of soft spoken guys. And so therefore they're playing against type. And while that's a joy with hindsight, I think maybe at the time people weren't fully dialed into that they didn't buy it yeah. so that's an issue with the film uh the, the the bob hope bing crosby road movie stuff doesn't work because it's not bob hope enough there's not enough yep. uh, uh quick quick one-liners and and you can have like i say with something like love and death you can have a big convoluted epic storyline of 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 battles and great romance and weird russian families but as long as you've got woody allen in there prat falling and saying one liners or you know you could have a big convoluted thing about the cia and terrorists in the desert and you know uh, all this sort of stuff going on uh, and who do you side with and blah 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 if you had this dub this like strong funny double act in the middle but then Making them uh, 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 failed uh, songwriter dreamers is fascinating for us, but it's the wrong type of character to carry this other plot. They yeah. either have to be smarmy, uh, you know, quick-witted uh, stand-up types, yeah. um, or you're telling a different story. It doesn't work to put these these uh, 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 fish-out-of-water idiots in such a convoluted plot. You can put fish-out-of-water idiots in a dangerous uh, scenario. That's been done before. Like Spies Like Us is a perfect example of where yeah. they do a, a, another kind of Crosby, Hope, road movie uh, with two guys. But they're together all the time. Like, it's it, that's, that's more of a... And again, not a particularly successful movie, Spies Like Us. First 20 minutes, very funny. By the time you get them out on the mission, quote-unquote, I kind of lose interest so uh similar with ishtar but to say ishtar is a bad movie is wrong it's well made it's well directed it's well edited it's very glossy it's very you know these are bt has been on film sets for years hoffman's been on film sets for years these are people who know what they're doing elaine may is a very strong writer and there's lots of great ideas and lots of high peaks in it it's to, to call it a bad movie is is idiotic you know paranormal activity is a bad movie this is a <laughs> this is a good well-made film yeah it's got moments of moments of of pure genius uh, it, it's got definitely got major lulls it's it's flawed but um it's it's well worth watching and it's a great window into the um into the world of a of an amateur uh, entertainer a few moments i just want to mention that are are awesome i like the the concert that they end up putting on in the middle of the movie in the hotel um where it's just Beatty for a little while but then hoffman shows up uh, I get goosebumps because the, the crowd actually likes them. And it's like they have their moment. They're just singing crowd pleaser songs for this, you know, this bland audience. But it's like they're having their moment. I love it. That well, was they're great. Like, they're like expats, aren't they? Or, or maybe yeah. they're military families or whatever living in the desert. And they go along to this cafe and all they want to hear is either the latest pop songs and or the great American songbook. That's all they're interested in. Yes. So they end up doing these very cheeseball half assed versions of them, but the crowd are just eating it up because they're shouting out, you know, do my way or do whatever, like do one of these songs. And they do them in this like cheeseball way. And it's a great success. And then there's that wonderful hope in Hoffman's line at the very end of that particular gig where he goes, this is great. Tomorrow night we'll do our songs. And you just know that if that's, 
that's what they did. It wouldn't work. Like, you know that all the crowd yeah. wants. And it's a great, it's also a great comment on uh, 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 audiences in general, because there's a thing. Individuals can be intelligent. People on mass are stupid. And mm. it, it, you see it in pop charts all the time. Songs you wouldn't wipe your bum with uh, become huge hits because, you know, 14-year-olds who have no sense of anything are buying them or, or or because people want wallpaper in the back of their room when they're working. They just want whatever it is playing in the background. They don't want anything they have to think about or anything that's had a lot of thought or creativity put into it. They just want white noise while they're trucking or while they're writing or while they're uh, working in an office or working in a shop or whatever it is. And this is this stuff that plays on radio all the time and becomes these big songs. Um, and uh, uh, this is what becomes popular. And this is what's shown in this this uh, club in the middle of uh, um, Morocco is that all this audience want are songs they've heard a hundred times over. They don't care who's doing it. They don't care if it's Frank Sinatra or Dustin Hoffman off key with a bandana. You know, like they don't care. As long as someone is singing uh, one of these songs we've all heard a hundred times, it's the same reason why people go to karaoke. They don't go to karaoke to pick weird little esoteric songs. It's to belt out my way in front of a crowd of strangers and have them uh, uh, applaud your great genius something yeah like yeah that. and in that way it's an <laughs> insightful it's insightful of the of elaine may you know to to de depict that happening for them because it's frankly the only um situation where they're going to get especially in a place where the the, the audience is starved for anything american too right but it's also interesting that even and it's like what we say about podcasting uh, even though people are like starved for entertainment even if you went ahead and gave them entertainment, even if it was their own songs and, you know, they put their heart and soul into it and they did it, they wouldn't like it. They'd be like, no, I, want the, other I, I yeah. want the other entertainment that I want. What is this? What is this? I don't know what this is. Like, no one's willing to give anything a chance. It's hilarious. A couple other awesome moments. Like you said, when, they, when Hoffman says, we didn't need a pencil, that's a, a fantastic moment. And... Um, and when they're shooting at the helicopter with a grenade launcher, um, it's that's pretty awesome too. And to see Charles Grodin's reaction, uh, you know, back at like the base, right. and he's like, "Oh, this is this has kind of gotten a little bit out of hand." Yeah, yeah. And, yeah. The, and then the big concert at the end, where the military is, you know, brings in an audience and forces them to clap for uh, for the guys. The songs that they sing in that closing concert are awesome. Hello, Ishtar, and. I look to Mecca and I see the place where we lived and the funny old tree that we sat under is, is one of the lines. And what, there's what? not some, like, you know, there's some songs which are clearly good songs that they've deliberately put in one bad line to go, oh, these guys wrote it. But there were some songs that, that could have been, I want to hear all their songs. I yeah. want to hear all the songs that they're writing in the apartment at the beginning. I want a full version of uh, Ice Cream Sunday Love or whatever. The, the, Hot you know, Fudge Love. Hot yeah. Fudge. I want a whole fully produced album of every song they're meant to have written because I would love it. I would absolutely I, yeah, it, uh, get a big kick out of it. It should just be a movie about a couple of hapless songwriters. And they, Tom Scalzo um, of, of my band Mose Haven has said that in the moment where they are leaving for Morocco, um, it's, the next cut should be them returning from Morocco and saying uh, that was a mistake, and then continuing their <laughs> continuing their New York um, adventures. You know, like <laughs> the desert stuff is so unnecessary. They they had this brilliant, th these two brilliant characters and, and hilarious songs and a great premise, and then they just threw it into uh, Middle Eastern intri intrigue, which is a very 80s thing to do, I think. So, like, 80s comedies can be so bombastic, you know, like... Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. Like, Three Men and a Baby, it could have just been a, a cute movie about three bachelors and a baby, but they have to throw in this, like, drug trafficking uh, subplot, you know? Oh, yeah, no, there has to be crime and intrigue behind every uh, uh, window or door or whatever. Like, there has to be something going on that is also some sort of action plot or some sort of yeah, thriller plot. It's or some so sort out of, of place. Yeah. Because right. that doesn't happen to 
in real life. I mean, it really <laughs> just doesn't. You know what I mean? I, I, it doesn't matter what I do. I'm not going to end up in the... Well, knock, knock on wood, I'm not going to end up in the desert firing at helicopters. Um, because I just wouldn't let them put me on a plane. You know? <laughs> I would rather yeah. be shot in the face before they send me to, you know, uh, anywhere like that. But I'm glad that I uh, got you to watch Ishtar, though, um, and and I'm glad you uh, you you definitely appreciate it. it, it w- that's your overall thoughts on uh, Ishtar. Oh yeah, no, it, it perfect. It has every right to exist. It's a perfectly decent movie. Ignore why it was or how it was put together. Ignore the fact that it flopped. Uh, there's plenty to enjoy. Um, you know, be aware that it doesn't, it is a flawed movie, it doesn't work on all counts, but also be aware that there's some, like, a real hidden gem of a movie in there. And listen, how many movies that we love from the 80s, from any era, but especially, as you say, the 80s, how many movies from the 80s really would stand up plot-wise or, or pacing-wise to great amounts of scrutiny? You know what I mean? Yeah. Even even Ghostbusters, and I love Ghostbusters, and Ghostbusters is this great, big, huge success story, and blah, 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 blah. There's even moments in Ghostbusters where you're like, I'm sorry, what? There's yeah, even where the, moments the in ghost, that movie. Where the ghost gets intimate with Dan Aykroyd. Why is that dream sequence in there? Why is <laughs> that, that is in so there? Strange. That was it's, a dream sequence? I didn't even realize. It's a dream sequence Ugh. where, why is he in there? Why is he wearing what seems to be like a commander's outfit with epaulet, big gold epaulets and stuff why is why is the ghost about to fillet him like what is that all about <laughs> what get rid of it dan what is that doing in the movie it's it's a knob gag in a movie to go oh look here's a knob gag but we doesn't need it get it out so it's out of complete. place right, right, yeah. right. there's there's uh, uh, a few few scenes like that trading places has some scenes in it where i'm like oh get on with it i love trading Places. i think it's amazing but there's uh, there, there's so many of those movies where there are bits in it that don't work that we accept, we love when we move on. Um, it, it's always made me laugh that Ghostbusters 1, for example, is, is hailed as this great success, and Ghostbusters 2, which I think is as good, I enjoy it as much, I, I think it's yeah. as funny, but it is considered a shitty, inferior, terrible sequel that, that nobody likes and everyone wants to poop on from a great height, and I'm like... I I don't understand where you're coming from, man. It's Bill Murray. He's cracking wise. They're busting ghosts. What's your problem here? You know what I mean? Like, it's all the same stuff. Uh, uh, and the same goes for Ishtar. Like, you've heard the bad negative press about it. Don't believe it. Check it out. Just understand that some bits are going to be a little bit of a yeah. slog. But every movie has that, man. Every you're movie. absolutely right. And, and it's got some great insights into... Um, you make crea- me such a positive man, Matt. That's what you do. You make me such a positive reviewer. <laughs> you're welcome. Um, <laughs> some great insights into the creative process that, that, ring, that are super funny but really, really do ring true. And I think anyone who tries to do something creative is from time to time going to feel... Like a big old idiot, you know. Like the like even even the best songwriter every once in a while probably feels like like these guys. So it's it's really good for anyone who writes songs or does anything creative. Oh no, completely. And there are any number of songs that I write for albums even now, or that I wrote especially as a teenager. There's any number of songs that I wrote as a teenager that could quite happily sit next to the, the, these songs in terms of, like, poetic, <laughs> nightmarish uh, uh, rubbish. But, but uh, um, and, and everyone has a moment where they're like, hmm, maybe I'll write a song about, like you say, ice cream and love or something, and I'll try and put it together. And uh, uh, there are plenty of songs in the 50s that are as dopey as th- yeah. that song. So, like, no, I think, I think it is important. And, and, you know, since I've entered the world of the internet and uh, met people like you and, and, and met people like the Dola, Dola uh, uh, filmmakers and all the rest of it, like, I'm so much more open and so much more positive and so much more enthralled by that idea. And um, put in the male bonding angle there and put in some funny funny lines and some funny scenes and I'm all behind them. I would want a straight movie about them songwriting in which in the end they didn't have to con someone to get a gig. They got an actual gig and they were a success with these dopey songs. That would even say something about the mass appeal of crappy pop music. Uh, them being a success, they have a hot a, a, a top 40 hit with uh, a hot, hot Fudge Love or, or uh, um, the, the uh, Telling the Truth Can Be Dangerous. But have a top 40. I could point to any number of 
utterly stupid top 40 hits. Anything by Rod Stewart, for example, uh, from the 80s. Like, anything that he sang about. Uh, uh, like, Raspberry Beret by Prince. Come on now. Like, <laughs> what are you singing about? What are you talking about? So, uh, let, let's, let's have a movie in which these two guys are great successes and have it as a comment on the music industry. So. Yeah, and, and it could also be a comment on on the whole "so bad it's good" uh, approach to to art too. You know, sure th- that people people like them because they're laughing at them, but the songwriters themselves um, don't necessarily aren't aren't necessarily aware of it. But th- the songs are so good. Telling the truth can be dangerous business. It's just such a such a lame concept <laughs> to. To wrap a, a a lead single around, but dude, Elton John wrote "Sorry" seems to be the hardest word. Oh, I mean, come on, yeah. now it's it's the same damn thing, right? Yeah, but the, Elton luckily managed to sing it to put a little bit of soul into it, where these guys <laughs> just kind of telling the truth Please. can be dangerous business. And well, they're not it, musicians. If they if they wrote that song or the lyrics to that song and gave it to if they were the Bernie Taupin, let's say, yeah, to an Elton John. Who Elton knows? could sell it. You're totally right. <laughs> I would change the line about an accordion and rock and roll band, but I mean, there. Seriously, dude, people need to go back to some of the songs that that Elton and Billy Joel and other people did in the late seventies to beginning of the eighties. Eric Clapton or, or uh, 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 David Bowie. I mean, come on, the, the, some of the lyrics in there, they're not. You know, they're all over the place. So. Yeah, I would say it's all arbitrary. You know, you could be saying any words here, and, and it's as meaningful or meaningless as the next thing. But, but I mean, hey, this is Ishtar brings this men, this much um, thought. You know, it's thought-provoking, and it, it's, uh, it's joyous. And seriously, I, I teared up a little bit at the end. When they're in the desert shooting at the helicopter, and they're like, you know, uh, we're not, this isn't quiet desperation. And, um, you know, this, this isn't poverty, baby. It's like, you know what? You're right. They did a couple of guys who hopped on that plane to Morocco because they wanted to be musicians and they end up in the desert and they're like, well, we might die out here, but, uh, Hey, we're actually living in, 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 and that's awesome. I love it. Oh, that's the other <laughs> bit I forgot is when they suddenly realize they're out in the middle of the desert. The thing that gives them the most pain is that they're going to miss the show. They're gonna and miss if, they, the show. if they miss the show in this like dive bar in Morocco, then <laughs> they'll never get booked anywhere else in the world again. That's a great, that's a great thing. Cause they have this, they have this, uh, uh, understanding of the showbiz ethic that you have to be turn up for the show you have to be on time you have to be professional it doesn't matter what you do in the show but like you have to be on time you have to be professional and right out the gate they're going to get this reputation for people who <laughs> drop shows and stuff I, I i love that i think that's absolutely fantastic it, and, one yeah one uh, one last moment that i love is um when the camel won't move and they're yelling at it come on don't you want to move why do you want to just sit here you're going to get shot and then Beatty says uh you know, I kind of admire that. And Hoffman's like, me too. And I was like, yeah. Yeah, yeah, right, you know? right, right. It's the hilarious. camel's just giving up. Um, and the fact that at the very end of the movie, although there isn't, they attempt to have some sort of love triangle thing going on with Is- Isabella Aj- Ajani. Is that yeah. I, yeah, I don't know, but that's good enough for me. <laughs> I apologize, Isabella, if you're listening. Um, <laughs> But at the when ver- she's crying at the very end of all the people who get to see this gig at the very end, she out of everyone loves them. She just looks down teary eyed and says, I think they're fantastic or whatever. Yeah. And, uh, and it's good. And I believe her and, it, and it's awesome. So uh, watch Ishtar, ladies and gentlemen. It's not um, the everyone dud- needs but one fan, sir. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, well said. Well said. Hi, before we go on to the last film of the show, I do hope you're enjoying this episode of the After Movie Diner. And if you're enjoying this episode of the After Movie Diner, why don't you let us know by going over to patreon.com or our particular uh, website, which is www.patreon.com forward slash after movie diner. That's Patreon, P A T R E O N. Dot com and show your support for all the work that goes into creating these podcasts each week. And donate or sponsor or become a patron of the After Movie Diner. For as little as just $1 an episode or 70p if you're in the UK, you can show your appreciation and make sure that the After Movie Diner keeps on trucking throughout 2015 and well into the future. 
Uh, we absolutely adore putting the show together, and we really do try and do our very best with production and with songs and with comedy and with everything like that, while also trying to get interesting guests and talk about fascinating films. And you can show your appreciation of all that work by going over to www.patreon.com. That's P A T R E O N. Dot com forward slash after movie diner and sponsoring the show. Thanks ever so much for everyone who already does it, and thanks ever so much for everyone who's going to do it in the future. And now back to the show. Um, should we talk Funny Farm now? Yeah, let's talk Funny Farm. So, are you happy to do that? You're good. Oh, I, I, this is a, a great thrill for me because they came out around the same time, and they're both about struggling uh, artists or. or or misguided, perhaps that's the better word for it, misguided, or, or you know, overly ambitious. Chevy Chase is going to write the great American novel up in Maine, and, um, and, and, and again, it's like a cautionary tale. If you dare, to, <laughs> if you dare to, to quit your job and go write the great American novel, your wife is going to end up becoming uh, a successful children's author, and you're going to end up dressed in army fatigue trying <laughs> Try to destroy a postman <laughs> trying to get the mailman yeah yeah hey there's our movers chevy chase is leaving the city to live in the country see out there who the hell is that how should i know surrounded by earth's little living treasures mosquito with room to roam for his loyal dog is it alive a place where he can bond with nature oh and hook up with a few close friends where people take pride in their jobs. That maniac is our mailman. Where home is safe and secure. Where all the food tastes like mom's. And all the neighbors treat you like family. I have good news. We've decided to stay. Chevy Chase, Funny Farm. Oh, and it's it's such a it's it's a much more solid movie than Ishtar. It I don't think it has quite the highs that Ishtar hits at at times, but it doesn't have nearly the lows. It's I'd, I'd say Ishtar at moments is A plus, and at other moments is like a D. Whereas um, Funny Farm is like a, a B plus A minus from start to finish. Yeah, um, the only. The only reservation I have about Funny Farm is entirely a personal one. And that is that I don't tend to connect with... And I think of films like Money Pit and other films like that. I don't tend to connect with uh, movies in which everything goes wrong for someone. Um, Now, there is a much uh, uh, funnier, slightly surreal... Some great running gags, especially in this movie... That, that I, I love, that I cherish. I love the dog running away. I love the fact that the ducks keep trying to uh, uh, escape and they can't. And they keep every, everything that happens bothers the ducks. Yes. Like they show up and the ducks are all happy and serene and it's brilliant. The ducks are some of my favorite characters. <laughs> but everything from the removal man throwing the chair into the pond to the, the, the mailman every morning with his backfiring truck to... To uh, uh, every, everything, the dog tries to eat the ducks. Everything that happens, tries, that's a really funny through line. And then even when the ducks try and fly south for the winter, the duck hunters almost kill them. It's yeah. a, that's that's some great running uh, uh, business. But but all the stuff about uh, uh, this doesn't work in the house and and arguments between the couple and uh, 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 everyone in town hates them and he ends up eating lamb's testicles by mistake. Like all that stuff, I'm a bit like. I, I don't really embrace that comedy. Yeah. No, I, I know what you mean. I know what you mean for sure. And I'm, I'm usually focused more on just the Chevy, uh, Chevy trying to be a writer and Chevy falling into his his bit of de- of depression and, uh, right. and and drinking and hanging out with the Criterion Brothers. That, right. That's what it's. All. I agree. Like the the whole fishing um, scene when the, when he goes fishing with those guys. I, I don't care one way or, no, or the other. Right. It's, so I, I hear you there. I, I forgive it, but I guess there are a few more lows than I'm giving it. Than I'm but giving no, no, it credit but the for. best bits is things like the sheriff doesn't know how to drive. That's brilliant. That's a fantastic gag. Um, but then again, the gag that uh, the funeral home is trying to charge them thousands of dollars to bury this body they find on their property. Again, don't care. Don't yeah. take it out. Not, 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 not really relevant. It, it's just. Um, 
Miser- I'm not one for schadenfreude uh, comedy. I don't like laughing at the misfortune of others. It's just not something... If it's a well-set-up uh, pratfall, like a Buster Keaton thing or a, a Laurel and Hardy thing or whatever, that's brilliant. I think that's really well done. Um, and if it's a, a funny running gag or a good character-based thing or if, if the person him, himself gets himself wrapped up in a farcical situation then great. But just um, uh, misery happening to others, I'm always like, oh no, please don't destroy that lovely home, or oh no, I wish the dog would come back, or, or oh no, I wish he wasn't divorcing his wife, or whatever. And it, like, it just... I get personally invested in the characters, and, and uh, maybe I shouldn't, maybe I should be able to be detached, but I don't want to watch a movie detached. I, I, you know, I want to get involved, so... I hear you. Like uh, when he's eating the lamb fries, that's that's just like uh, it's not it's not clever or uh, or right. smart. Just you make know. him a success. Like make it. It would be so much funnier. Like what about Bob, it, it, where they always wanted to buy the home, but then they but then the doctor bought the home out from under them. The old couple, and so every time he sees the doctor, the the the, the wife is like son of a bitch, and he's like she never says that. That's really funny. But if so, have it in Funny Farm. That when he eats the lamb fries and he beats the record, that someone else in town is then angry at him for beating his record. That Rather, would be yeah. a great gag. But having it just that he ate testicles, like it's yeah, it's like come on, that that's like uh, second grade uh, humor stuff. So, but the yeah. joyous bit of that whole evening, the whole anniversary night out, is the fact that his big surprise is he's written this book. <laughs> the book. He gives it to his wife to read on his anniversary. He takes her to this romantic cottage, he lights a fire, he gets champagne, and then goes, sit down and read my manuscript. <laughs> and it, um, that rings so true in my life. As soon I was as I, ask, I was gonna ask. As soon as I've finished anything, I want to show it to my wife, and I just stare at her as she's <laughs> looking, if she's listening to a song I did, I'm like, isn't it good? Isn't it good? It's exactly that scene. And um, have you ever done it on an anniversary though, or a special, or <laughs> Valentine's Day, I, or something? I have a little bit more sense than to, than to <laughs> just barely a little more. And that that's the heart. That's the heart of the movie. It's it's this it's this dark, sad um, vortex that that uh, Chevy goes into um, because he's not a good writer. And the, the scene where he where he starts writing. First off, the big heist is such a wonderfully bland title right. for. For his great American novel, and and then he sits there and he writes the, and he falls asleep. I just love that. <laughs> right, right. And then of course the the bird outside the window yes. when he first sees it is like, oh wow, nature coming into my little world. And then within a day he's throwing his coffee at it because it's still <laughs> chirping away, and he's like, oh, he's like, oh, fucking, it just throws his coffee at it. You know? Then we see Chevy at the typewriter typing and laughing at what he's come up with, which it totally feels like me <laughs> <laughs> right there. Um, Yellow Dog, I love Yellow Dog. Um, Yellow Dog's uh, just like the duck. Yellow Dog's a great character. Don't you like him? I, l- I love Yellow Dog, and I love the fact that th- the only thing that excites him is digging up a corpse. <laughs> everything, else is, everything else is asleep. The best bit of business with Yellow Dog is Chase coming in, sniffing ever so slightly. Uh, you wouldn't yes. even If you were just watching this movie, you wouldn't necessarily notice, but he sniffs ever so slightly, uh, bends down, and just delicately pulls <laughs> Yellow Dog's tail out of the fire. Or it's, out of the edge uh, yeah. of the fire, and then goes back to sitting down. It's just a wonderful bit of business. And, and there's the subtle, the subtle and smart humor. You know, uh, so uh, so diametrically opposed to the lamb fry scene. You know. Oh yeah, and completely. I want more of just the subtle, the subtle joke that that yellow dog is so mellow that <laughs> he, he his tail is burning in the in the fire, and he just <laughs> lets it happen, and Chevy has to move it. Oh, that is. So I, I, like subtle. To, I like to think the yellow dog's kind of depressed. I like to think he's given up on life. <laughs> oh, and only, only then it gets excited when bones are on the menu and he can <laughs> dig up bones. Uh, and then the, he walks in on this wonderful carol concert later on <laughs> with a full human arm in his mouth happily. Like, <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and then the, the wife's got to hit him with a frying pan. Which and the is next really time... dark and twisted that she has to beat the dog around the head. You know, I know. We laugh at it because the door shuts, you don't see it, you hear a thunk, you hear a squeak, and then the dog falls down, and you go, ha, ha, ha. 
But at the same time, like, she just felt, like, if you saw it, like, someone actually hit a dog around the head, that wouldn't be funny, you know? I know, I know. And then he's got the um, the ice pack on his head the next time we see him, which is a nice little touch, too. Oh, yeah, no, that's lovely. And, and you know, we're well aware that Yellow Dog can take it. <laughs> <laughs> but it's also the fact that Yellow Dog then, after that incident goes back to being depressed. There's no more excitement about the dead body anymore. <laughs> That's it. He's been told, no, you can't have any fun. And he just goes back to being depressed again. But the, 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 that's, that's one of the wonderful bits, is when, so distraught at the experience of everything that's going on, he buys a dog. He's like, if I can't make any friends in the town, I'm going to buy one. And he buys a, this wonderful Irish set <laughs> They he drive it home with a dog cell on his lap. He gets it out and tries to kill the dog. And then he's like, shoo, don't go to the dog. And the dog just runs away. And it's paid off brilliantly when later he sees the dog running over the hill. And he's like, hey, 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 like that. The dog just runs those yeah. bits. I'm all about those bits. Yeah, yeah, because uh, and I think uh, quite often it, 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 it does have that subtle subtle humor. You know, I, and... and the the set piece uh, again the lamb fries is the best example of it but also when he's on the boat and hitting the guy you know trying to knock the guy out when he's got the hook in him right um, and it, that's a little over the top and a little eighties in that way too you know just well, it's going like I, I love the great outdoors with John Candy and Dan Aykroyd but the scene where they go off in the speedboat and hilarity doesn't really ensue. I don't care about that. You know what I mean? It's yeah. just, oh, look, fat man on a speedboat is funny. It's like, well, no, it's not. Let's just move on from that. Yeah, give me some subtle humor, uh, please. And luckily, though, they they deliver. And I mean, it's just it's just funny to see how then then the wife is is writing a children's book, you know, and, and how she explains to him what the book's about, you know. That's it's, another great scene when she's in the antique shop and everything she picks up, she yes. like picks up the teacup and she's like, that's all I have to that's remember it. my dead sister from or something. Yeah, it's the only thing that survived the explosion, I think. <laughs> and then she sits down in the rocking chair. This is lovely. I'm going to have this. Yeah. I don't think anyone's sat in there since my dearly departed husband. Like everything, <laughs> she's just ruining everything for this old lady who's the librarian from Ghostbusters to bring it back to Ghostbusters. Oh, I did not know that. Yeah, 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 yeah. And then she ends up, then she sits down and gets horrified by the stuffed squirrel. But then that ends up being her inspiration, just like me working in the, the basement of the North Las Vegas municipal Absolutely. buildings yeah. uh, inspires uh, a mediocre <laughs> album several years later. Oh, no, no. It's a fantastic album. Don't, come on. We're still pushing this thing. Oh, yeah. Sorry. Yeah, yeah fantastic album. Um, so, you know, it's, it's just, it's just great to watch Chevy, you know, Chevy starts drinking, he's not writing anymore, you know, um, and he's just, uh, he's completely focused on the mailman, which, you know, it's like the movie is almost a little bit about writer's block too. You know, it's like any distraction that you will accept any distraction you can to avoid the task of, of writing this book, you know? Right, right, right. It's almost... People don't necessarily, like, to be in a city, some people get it, some people don't. And I understand some people are city folk and some people aren't. The best thing about the city is, while there are a million distractions, they're also all distractions you can completely ignore once you're in your own place. Like, mm -hmm. here I am, sat up, sat up in the Bronx in New York. I don't feel like I'm in New York. I don't feel like I'm in the Bronx. I'm in my space. I'm in my room. I'm in my place. I can podcast. I can write. I can do my music. I can whatever. And then I can go out and enjoy the city and blah, 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 blah. Now, yeah, occasionally on a Saturday, the upstairs neighbors have a party or and you can hear noise or music or whatever. Or during the day, you can hear uh, 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 stuff going on outside. But it's all stuff to me that is part of my world anyway. Like I, I can tune it out or tune it in as I see fit. But whereas if you took me to the countryside and there was a bird specifically chirping, yeah. uh, that would, that would really, uh, I'd be like, Oh, that bird's going to keep doing that. Is it? Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, no, that's a very good point because when everything else is, is all oh, the volume of everything else is lowered than the, the one thing that, that is out there making noise seems amplified. Right, yeah. right, right. Whereas and, for example, when I, uh, taking it back to the album very quickly, there's a track on my album that's recorded as the Dawn Chorus was singing. Um, I have a, as I say, I have a window looks over onto a courtyard at the back of my apartment, right by where I record. And I heard the Dawn Chorus all summer because, like you say, I was up at these ludicrous times of the morning. Um, <laughs> 
go to bed, John. Uh, I had the window <laughs> open and I could hear the dawn chorus and it didn't bother me because it was all part of the experience. Like to me, that was wonderful. As you say, if all the other volume was turned down and all I heard was that all day, that would be, yeah, no good. Um, so then, uh, and then like the, much like in Ishtar, um, how they kind of, um, they tie it up with, um, the big, the army is basically forced, the military is forced to promote the new album by, uh, by these guys just kind of wrap things up in a nice little ending. They, they, they have this ending where they pay off the town to help them sell their house. And uh, it's kind of funny, especially the cue the deer moment is pretty funny. Right. When Chevy does that. And I like when the guy who's about to buy that, who wants to buy the house, says, I want everything, even the dog. And then you see Chevy's like, Yellow dog? Yeah, <laughs> he's, like, <laughs> that's a great little moment. And then the dog looks up with his, uh, with his um, ice pack on his head. And that's a great little moment. But yeah. uh, I think the heart of the movie is really just watching. Um, Watching Chevy's fa- failed attempts at being a writer. That's those are the moments I like when right. he show when he shows her the the script in the in the little bungalow. That that's a great scene. And the fact that she, you know, she doesn't like it. It's it's just so great. That's their their big night out. And well, that's up- the, that's the most Ishtar moment is when she says there are flashbacks and there are flash forwards. And I think even at one point a flash, flash sideways. sideways. Yeah, like that's a very Ishtar thing. We never get to read any of the novel, unfortunately, but. Uh, uh, it, that that feels to me like the most Ishtar moment in terms of creativity and writing. Yeah, so it's good. It's dark. It's funny. It's dark. Um, you know. Yeah, I, I don't buy the whole we're going to get divorced thing, but then that's all done away with in because they know that they've paid the townsfolk, so they know they know that whatever they've lived in the last twenty four hours hanging out with these people they're trying to get to sell the property to is fake. Yeah. So. Why that then wins them over instead of the other couple? It's fine. You go with it. It's a movie trope. It is what it is. Yeah. And you you are rooting for them to get back together. You don't want them to get divorced or have this all fall apart. Yeah. Um, but uh, um, I, I don't necessarily uh, I don't necessarily buy it. Him, however, becoming a small town sports writer and her becoming a, a children's book author and them having a family and staying in the small town. I totally buy that. I yeah, mean, that works. That, that that's fantastic. Works. If there was if there was a way back when when I was married, if there was a way that I could have taken uh, what I do with a podcast and become a, uh, a movie reviewer for the you know, Bangor Gazette or something and gone and lived in the countryside. I would have like, I would have done that in a heartbeat. I would go live up a mountain somewhere in a cottage or a cabin. I'd write a paragraph about each movie that was playing at the local three screen theater. And that would be, I'd be that happy as Larry. So I I get that ending very, very much so completely. Yeah. And I don't think I, I don't think they like a hundred dollars is no, it's fifty dollars per person to help if they do something specific to help sell the house. It's like, is that enough incentive that you're going to spend an entire weekend uh, singing carols and stuff? You know what I mean for the well, townsfolk? I, yeah, I mean I think the other glaring error in this movie is that the townsfolk are mostly either like the sheriff. Who are going to be like, ah, these city folk, let them have their comeuppance. Or, like, there's nothing I can do about it. You know, I'm just a jolly small town sheriff. Or Mm -hmm. they're grumpy hicks who are idiots. Um, There's no, there is a, there is more of a chance to make a nice, uh, uh, to create a world. To give, like, everyone different characters. And I think maybe they thought they were doing that with the crazy sheriff and the old antiques lady. But... I could do with more of that and I could do with less of it being us against them. I could do with someone in the town beyond the antiques lady, like liking them or something. I I, I don't know why, but I just find the whole, we're a big bunch of ignorant hicks who are going to do whatever we can for 50 bucks. Like that kind of doesn't sit well with me. Yeah, it just, uh, it it just, uh, it's, it's not believable. And, and that's not the heart of the movie. I, in fact, I could have watched the if the movie was just Chevy and his wife in the cottage, right. uh, you know, having like this back and forth between uh, uh, each other's writing careers. That would have uh, 
That, that's what I would have liked. How about the the Shining and Funny Farm? Perhaps there's a, there's some they're both um, allegories about uh, writer's block. I'm just throwing that out there. No, I, listen, that is definitely a parallel <laughs> that I will happily accept, and I'm not saying that because it's funny to say it. I'm I'm saying it because it's it's true. Uh, it doesn't get as dark and twisted. He doesn't chase anyone with an axe, but it. In a comedic sense, it gets pretty close. He wants to destroy the mailman with a big boulder. Like, he would happily see that mailman, like, his truck crushed and him possibly injured. He'd happily see that. Yes. Uh, They are going to divorce. They are planning to divorce. Uh, uh, She does beat the dog over the head with a pan. Like, it gets pretty... He does, it gets dark, yeah. He does rebury the dead body they find on their property, <laughs> back in the property, for no other, not for the financial reason, but to spy his wife. <laughs> uh, that's why he does it, to say, like, well, see if she likes it now with the dead body back on the property. Like, it gets pretty dark. Yeah, uh, another thing I love is just the phrase, four poker buddies knocking over a casino. Yeah, right. Uh, <laughs> He he said he he describes it to her as that, and then when the publisher calls her and she answers, and and he says it's about um, squirrels, she's like, I thought it was about four poker buddies knocking over <laughs> a casino. It's it's a funny little moment. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, yeah it's it's an interesting examination of uh, of the creative process, and it's it's got some some darkness to it. It has. Uh, you know, I like we could do without all of the townspeople. Honestly, I mean, I, I'll keep the mailman. I would keep the mailman, and that's about it. But um, but it's got moments, and um, and I, I'm never I'm never uh, upset with any of it. I'm always comfortable in in this world and sitting back. And there's always little moments that keep me keep me chuckling, keep me entertained. I I quite like that. Uh the refrain at the beginning with the movers is like, whenever I find the guy who wrote this map and the sell off of that, the payoff of that joke rather is when the movers show up and Chevy Chase is really angry. The he's like, you've been like 24 hours. We had to sleep on the floor, blah, 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 blah. I drew you that map. Like that's a great payoff to that bit. Now him getting angry and throwing the chair in the pond or whatever is, is fine. But uh, uh, um, uh, Chevy Chase ending his rant as the van is coming down the driveway and the two guys being legitimately worried, like, oh, no, we're not going to get paid for this now and we're going to have to do a refund and blah, 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 blah. Once it ends with, I drew you a map, you know uh, that's it, you know, that, that he's for the high jump. and Yeah, there's lots the of nice touches in the script. You know, it's uh, I think it's pretty well written and a lot of things come back, little... By Jeffrey Bohm, who would go on to write and produce Adventures of Briscoe County Jr., as ah. well as being one of the producers on Lost, I believe. Interesting. Another great moment is she eats the apple, the last bit of food that's left when they're uh, waiting for the um, movers to arrive. And, and, and he, he hears her biting into the apple as she's singing to him. And then way when, they, when she announces she wants a divorce, he brings it up. He's like, uh, and what about the apple? He oh, yeah, says, yeah, yeah. He's tried to sell her manuscript as his own, and yet his big <laughs> counter-argument <laughs> is, but what about the apple? You know, Don't uh, deny it. I stepped on the core, he says, and that's, that's a great little touch. So, yeah, it's well written. What do you get on those guys? Oh, yeah, um, Jeffrey uh, Bohm, uh, fascinating guy. What a string of hits he wrote in the 80s. Check this out. Uh, the Dead Zone, uh, Inner Space, the Lost Boys, Funny Farm, Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade, Lethal Weapon 2, Lethal Weapon 3, uh, and The Adventures of Briscoe County Jr. He only puts a foot wrong with The Phantom in 1996, but up until then, it hits all the way for uh, Jeffrey Bohm, writer, producer, director. Pretty cool, pretty cool. And th- this one, Funny Farm, pretty much under the radar, you know? I, it, you don't hear it mentioned by a lot of people. When people are talking... Chevy Chase movies, you're going to hear the Vacation movies and Fletch. Um, in Funny Farm, I, I rarely hear people mention. I, th- I think it's an overlooked uh, gem. Right, indeed. Yeah, his writing partner is Carlton Coos, although uh, he uh, did not work on this one, but he did a lot of TV uh, with uh, Jeffrey Bohm. He, he, he's the one who worked on Lost 
uh, and Nash Bridges, Martial Law, uh, uh, The Adventures of Briscoe County Jr., and so on. He's more of a TV writer. But Jeffrey Bone, what a string of hits, man! What a what a what a what an interesting guy. It would be wonderful to talk to him about his writing process and what he did to uh, put these movies together. But he does a bit of action, a bit of comedy, uh, a bit of horror. It's all good. And George Roy Hill um, directed it, and he's uh, of, uh, you know, Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid fame. So uh, he, he's a pro. I think it might have been one of his last movies. Is that, are you looking at that or no? Yeah, his big films were Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid and Slapshot, World According to Garp, and Funny Farm was indeed his last film as a director. Um, yeah, in 1988. Yeah, you can tell it's a professionally made uh, little little movie, and... Um, it has a lot of nice touches, and um, I, I enjoy I enjoy re, revisiting it, uh, especially from the viewpoint of um, of a failed uh, right <laughs> as a failed creative person myself. I uh... you're, but you're not, sir. That's the thing is you're not at all. Um, I want to know though. Do you know what this got me thinking? Um, I just get one last point before I go on to this. George Roy Hill um, did the Sting as well, Slapshot. Uh, World According to Garp's probably his deepest movie, but I think a very um, charming f- filmmaker. The, the, nothing too uh, um, heavy or, 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 or ominous. Just a very light, uh, but does it well. Does like light, yeah, uh, charming. Like a pro- just a pro. professional, a professional filmmaker guy who knows what he's doing, and uh, you know you can just trust him with a uh, project. It seems not that I know anything about him, but yeah. But this is this is uh, what I wanted to ask. Having seen Funny Farm and knowing your setup uh, uh, there at home and what you do, uh, is Elizabeth uh, frantically penning songs in the attic <laughs> and secretly making an album without you knowing? And are there any plans? Because I know she's a wonderful singer. For Elizabeth to, and you to do an album of just songs with her and. Or you and her doing a Sonny and Cher thing and singing together? Or do you think that would destroy the balance? Would that ruin? Uh, well, it, I, it would be, uh, we talk about collaborating, but it would be, um, it would, it would be interesting for sure. Um, but one thing, uh, the way we work is she comes up with, uh, her viewpoint is that she comes up with really good ideas and never follows through on them. And I come up with really bad ideas and always follow through on them. <laughs> so, um, but she definitely gives me a lot of ideas too. And anytime I'm doing an album, um, if I'm coming up with topics, uh, I'll brainstorm with her. So that, that our most of our collaborating is in that is in the early stage of each album. But, like a um, Tom Waits, Kathleen Brennan type affair. Absolutely. Yeah. He credits cool. her as co-songwriter on all his songs, but I get the feeling from interviews that it's more that she is his muse, you know? Yeah, big pic- like she's there for the big picture stuff, and then he, he takes over for the nitty-gritty. I, I imagine so, although I'm, I have no idea she might be a, 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 a lyrical genius, who knows? Good point, good point. All right, any other thoughts on Funny Farm? Uh, no, I think I think both movies, while they're not the 80s comedies I'm going to put in all the time, they are perfectly well made, perfectly charming, and both have their uh, high moments. Remembering some of the bits right now has made me laugh out loud. That's a genuine reaction. So uh, if you haven't checked them out, I say check them out on a rainy Sunday afternoon and have a bit of a chuckle. Bit of a what I like to think of as a calm, charming chuckle. It's not a laugh out loud, anarchic. Uh, 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 you know, quick one-liner will laugh a minute, but there's plenty to enjoy. Yeah, uh, Funny Farm's a lot more subtle than Ishtar, and Ishtar is a big old mess, <laughs> for yeah. sure. It's, it is definitely a mess. So critics who might have pointed that out are correct, but to call it the worst movie ever made uh, is ridiculous. It's, it's, it's made by talented and intelligent people, and it's got... Great moments, so um, yeah. I'm, gl- I'm glad that we've uh, brought and that to light tonight. Britney Spears and One Direction have both made movies, so look, it's hardly the worst movie ever made. Very good point. <laughs> I've come down a lot on pop stars uh, this podcast, and I think it's going to be uh, a lot of people are going to be like, wait a minute, he's just an anti-populist. I'm not buying his album. Screw him with his opinions on Miley Cyrus and Britney Spears. And if I, don't think, yeah, I don't think there's a lot of Miley fans who are also <laughs> diner fans, so you're fine. I, I don't know, man. I think there might be an interesting crossover. <laughs> I like to think about it. I know I often think, thinking about like creativity and stuff, it's an odd beast. 
Um, I know that if I just did a 50 minute movie podcast that started a movie podcast and ended a movie podcast, I would have so many more listeners. I know that people tune in and go, this, I thought it was a movie podcast. What's all this silly comedy? Boom, turn it off. I know that happens more often than not. Right. But the ones but who stay, not, the ones yeah. who stay, st- are, are really, um, get to know you and, yeah. and, 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 and live for it. You know? I'm so, creating a body of work that, yeah. that will live long after I die. That's yeah. what I want. Well, hey, I've listened to you discuss um, <laughs> dozens of movies that I've never seen and never will see. But uh, it's... <laughs> you've never watched them. Nothing that. Yeah, my really. Yeah. yeah, I mean uh, those. Uh, is, well, before Kane and Keaton, what was the? Um, oh, Woods what... and Weller. Yeah, w- m- those Woods and Weller movies. I will not see any of them. But I, I listened to you guys dis- <laughs> discuss each and every one of them. I, I enjoyed it quite a bit. You would probably like uh, Leviathan, uh-huh. and uh, of. Uh, unnatural origin or unusual origin or whatever the rat one was where he was fighting off rats in a brownstone in New York because it's just Weller fighting off uh, beastly rats. You would love it in a sort of monster movie type way. Excellent. Anyway, sorry. (laughs) All right, I think we did it though. We did, sir. It was fantastic. It was great. I I hope I didn't keep you too late but I really enjoyed that, man. It's always a pleasure spending time with you and uh, we always have great conversations and... uh, that was great. Thanks so much, man, for helping me uh, uh, promote the album. And uh, I don't know. I think there's a nice cemetery between the the album talk and then going into Ishtar. So I might keep it as a whole long episode. Yeah, I, yeah, I, I would too. Yeah, I would too. And it does it does flow perfectly into it. So, but I love the way it looks, man. I love that. Like, I go on Spotify and there's my album cover that I designed. Like, I know. Awesome, right? I, I love it. Oh, it gives it's so me good. chills, man. I'm really yeah, excited. Yeah, I mean. For it. Twenty five years ago, to get an album in a record store would be you'd have to uh, be selected by a record company, you know. And now yeah. you just do it for twenty bucks. That's crazy. Yeah, and now uh, yeah. So we wait and see. I mean, like I say, no one's getting rich off this thing. But uh, and yeah, I've listened to your uh, Moat Media eight hour whatever it was once through so far. Oh, cool. God bless. Twenty fifteen. So I will try and do that again, and I will hopefully be around for World Moton Media Day uh, and, and be tweeting along. And hopefully, I mean, hopefully I'll say to my temp agent, can't work that day. It's World Moton Media Day. I've got to sit at my computer and listen to, uh, listen to Matt's yeah. stuff. I just did an episode with Tom last night. Um, nice. And um, in it, I did the math. I was like, we have about 100 listeners per episode. All we need is each of them to get 10,000 people to listen to the playlist, and we're done. Yeah, yeah, so that's it's, nice it's and easy. Ten thousand people, foolproof. <laughs> Great talk, sir. Yes, no, excellent, sir. Thanks so much, and uh, I urge everyone listening uh, to rate and review uh, Moton Media wherever they find it and all its incarnations, as well as uh, buy some albums and listen to Spotify. Because what a great man uh, who makes music is Matt. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome, sir. You're welcome. <laughs> all right. All Chucks right, away, friend. Take care. All right, bye. Bye-bye. What is it? I think they're wonderful. Telling the truth can be dangerous business. Honest and popular don't go hand in hand. If you admit that you can play the accordion, no one will hire you in a rock and roll band. But we can sing. Good job.